my fault. Could everyone take their seat, please? I'd like to uh, call the regular meeting of the Desert City Council, February 22nd, 2022, to order. Up first, we have invocation, Pastor Kevin Wendt from Grace Lutheran. Pastor, would you all stand, please, for the invocation? The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit be upon the United States of America, the state of Florida, the county of Okaloosa, the city of Destin. We pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, from you comes all rule and authority over the nations and states and cities of the world for the punishment of evildoers and for the praises of those who do well, for order and for justice. We humbly ask you to graciously regard these your servants in our city of Destin, these who make, administer, and judge the affairs of this city. Look with mercy upon them and grant them to bear the authority you've given them according to your command. Enlighten and defend them and give them wisdom and understanding that under reasoned and peaceable governance your people may be guarded and directed in righteousness and peace. We pray this in the name of him who is fully God, born of a virgin, fully man, to obediently live the perfect life, to pour out his innocent blood, the perfect sacrifice, to gloriously rise from the, the dead, the resurrection and the life, your son and savior from sin, ascended to heaven and to return the last day to judge the living and the dead, Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. All the people who came to see me give the State of the City address, I'm honored. More importantly, I didn't get the memo, I'm apparently in the wrong attire. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for attending. I'd like to, uh, to thank the Sheriff's Office for being represented here. Is Miss Ponder here anywhere? Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Chairman of the County Commissioners, Mel Ponder, for coming tonight. And. Uh, like to recognize uh, our city council. I'm going to do this in alphabetical order, just to throw a, a wrench in the wheel. I'd like to uh, recognize uh, Councilman Jim Bagby, uh, Councilman Rodney Braden, Councilman and Mayor Pro Tem Dewey Destin, Councilwoman Teresa Airbear, A Bear. Sorry about that, Teresa. A Bear. Uh, Councilman Johnny King. And Councilman Kevin Schmidt, who's not here, and uh, Councilman Bobby Wagner. Staff, members of the public. Through the strategic planning process, Council has established a vision statement, which is the anchor point of the city's strategic plan. This statement outlines what an organization would like to ultimately achieve and gives purpose to the mission of our city. Our vision statement that our Council members have established is, Destin is a family-oriented beach and fishing community where people want to live, work, and play, and where visitors are welcome to respectfully enjoy our community and its resources. That embodies a plan that's vital for our city because it ensures that the priorities set by the city council are conveyed in the organizational goals. In addition to our vision statement, council prioritized our key customer groups to provide us guidance for city priorities. Those customer groups are our year-round residents, Destin-based businesses, and our visitors. Our strategic plan fuels the strategic management process, which is how we will achieve these goals. A financially sound city providing excellent service, enhanced quality of life and safety for our families, economic development and revitalization to improve mobility and connectivity, 
effective, efficient, and aesthetically pleasing infrastructure in a green and sustainable environment. Mr. Wagner. He didn't make that up. From these established goals, council established these objectives for the organization to focus on for 2022, and these are in priority order. The council's top priority objective within the strategic plan is to offer livable wages and benefits to attract and maintain, maintain high caliber qualified staff. Council and staff have worked through the budgeting process to ensure this top priority objective could be achieved so that Destin can recruit, retain our most important resource, which is our employees. Thanks to the leadership of our city manager and deputy city manager in this council, a 5% COLA and up to a 2% marriage uh, increase was approved to help our staff meet the rising pressures of inflation. Council also approved a one-time longevity award for long-term eligible employees. The human resource staff was able to negotiate a new health insurance plan, providing increased benefits at more affordable rates. It was just one, of, one way the city council and administration is following through on our commitment to our staff by reducing costs for our employees and expanding limited health care benefits to our part-time workers. Another strategic goal is to improve the mobility and connectivity in Destin, and we're helping to meet that goal through the council objective of the two-lane crosstown connector. We all know what it's like to uh, travel through our city, especially during the busy tourist season. This project is designed to be an alternative road for our residents to access city amenities within Destin. And about 200 days out of the year, it's our road. Just last meeting, the City Council voted to proceed with property acquisitions and to continue keep pressing forward in the design of this important project. The design, engineering, and right-of-way acquisitions is slated for completion in fiscal year 2025. Another effort to improve mobility and connectivity as well as safety for our residents and visitors is our Council has discussed possible ways to design a pedestrian pathway underneath Highway 98 in our most busiest areas in the harbor. The city received over $6 million in grant revenues in fiscal year 2021. Those grant revenues represent over 26% of the city's total re revenues. Our projects, grants, and contract managers has worked on a five-year project projection for grant revenues exceeding $27 million. Projects like the Norego Point Improvement and Joe's Bayou Recreational Area Improvements are funded through the uh, Florida Department of Environmental environmental protection and are not reflective in the aforementioned uh, revenue numbers. The cost of both projects combined totaled more than $30 million, leaving Destin residents and visitors with two legacy parks and providing a substantial boost to our local economy. The city maintains an excellent relationship with our local, state, and federal agencies to make the grant awards at this level possible. And it's our goal to continue these strong relationships to expand the grant funding as new opportunities become available. Enhanced quality of life and safety for our families, as well as green and sustainable environment, is another strategic goal for the city. The city's established a very ambitious part of that goal by beginning its beach acquisition program. This is now a reality thanks to the hard work and partnership between the city, Okaloosa County Board of County Commissioners, thank you, Mel, Okaloosa County Tourist Development Council and the Trust for Public Lands. We started with $2 million as a complement to acquire beachfront property and now have over $22 million committed. With most of the funding coming from tourist tax dollars, so far we've bought back over 100 feet of beach for public use in the Crystal Beach area. The exciting news is this initiative is going to provide even more public beachfront access and remain in our community forever. Our efforts to expand our beach access, open space, and preserve our beachfront for Destin will continue well into the future. Another strategic goal is to have effective, efficient, and aesthetically pleasing infrastructure. To accomplish this, our council and staff are in the process to underground utilities in the city. We've negotiated a new franchise agreement with Florida Power and Light, and that will allow us to move forward with undergrounding utilities along Highway 98 and throughout the city. By moving utility lines underground, this project will beautify the area and protect the lines from storm-caused power outage. Hardening our infrastructure to protect our homes and businesses and reduce the loss of power is a big win for all of us. This project is going to take 10 to 15 years, 
and a substantial investment, but it's a worthwhile endeavor for our city to improve safety, better reliability, and create an unobstructed gateway throughout the city of Destin. At this time, I'd like to briefly talk about uh, and highlight some of our departments and how they're helping to accomplish the strategic goals and objectives Council has, has established for our city government. Uh, a lot of you don't come here regularly two times a month, so I kind of want to bring you all up on the speed of some of the things that this city does behind the scenes that most of you don't see. This past year, the Community Development Department was focused on improvements in three key metrics in the delivery of their services. These metrics are customer service, productivity, and quality of life projects. The department has now fully implemented a new Compass software system. The early results of this implementation are already showing substantial improvements in customer service. The Compass portal enables residents, developers, contractors, and business owners to easily apply for their building permit, their development orders, business tax receipts, and engineering applications from their computer in the comfort of their home or their office. They can submit necessary documents, track the progress, pay invoices, and receive final documentations via the Compass portal without calling or making a trip to the City Hall Annex. June, July, and August, that's a real benefit. Furthermore, the average turnaround time between application submittal and permit issuance for permits and business tax receipts has improved by 80%. With respect to productivity, the volume of permit application submittals has risen with a 25% increase since the implementation of Compass this past year. In addition to the department's process, uh, they've uh, processed 61 development orders, 771 building permits, and completed over 5,169 inspections. Thanks to the leadership of our community development staff and land use attorney, the city is accomplishing the strategic goal of economic development and revitalization by aligning the city's comprehensive plan, future land use map, and zoning map, which will guide the deaths of future development and redevelopment. And this has not been done for over 30 years, so it was a big, big task. In addition to the completion of the harbor capacity study that will guide our council on ways to enhance the economic vitality and safety of the harbor, Staff has completed the preparation of the city's wayfinding master plan, which help our city define the Destin brand. This initiative is more than just creating a sign or signage. It'll produce results that will re re represent the city's heritage, soul, and character. Our code compliance department. Our code compliance has been working diligently to create a culture of professionalism and individual commitment to improve the quality of life of Destin residents. Starting with a focused effort to gain voluntary compliance through the education of our codes and ordinances, they've been focused on providing for the safe health and welfare of our citizens and visitors alike. The department has increased staffing and all officers become dual certified Florida code compliance officers and parking enforcement specialists. In 2021, our code compliance department addressed almost 10,000 code compliance case activities which is down from almost 14,000 in 2020. So this proves that compliance efforts and the education of our city codes is working. Code has also established a designated patrol division, beach, harbor, and waterways division, and registration division with the code compliance department. The newly created registration division and the new Compass software has accelerated our city's regi registration process Overall code compliance is maintaining a 90% compliance rate and providing service excellence for our community. Our PIO, who's at Space Camp right now, is keeping our citizens informed and communicating what the city's doing is a key role of our PIO. She's done an excellent job uh, communicating with our community and media relations, increasing social media engagements on city platforms, strengthening relationships with our strategic partners, and more importantly, is a reliable source of information for our residents, businesses, and visitors. Don't get your information from Facebook. In 2021, we had over 368,000 visits to our website and our social media exposure is growing. We also had a broader outreach through traditional media and had over 172 stories covered by local and regional media outlets. I'd like to acknowledge our city clerk, who's vastly overworked and underpaid. <laughs> the city clerk's office works diligently with Municipal Code Corporation to streamline the ordinance codification process. Processing time for ordinances enacted by city council was reduced from six weeks to less than three. 
The volume and diversity of public records requests filed with the city continues to increase, and technology has played a key part in allowing staff to be more transparent while providing a quicker response and fulfilling records request. In 2020, the staff received 388 public records requests, and in 2021, 502 that were made. The staff was able to fulfill those requests within three days of receipt, 94% of the time. Finance. Our department is helping us to remain financially sound by refinancing several loans in 2021, which re will result in $400,000 less interest payments over the next seven years. With assistance from other departments, our finance department set up continuing service contracts or contract prices and munis to speed up PO issuance and invoice reviews. Staffs work diligently to reorganize the accounting system to improve transparency, timeliness of reporting, especially for restricted funds. With a fiscal budget totaling over $34 million, the City Council continued to keep taxes low for Destin residents while providing service excellence for our residents, businesses, and visitors. I'd like to highlight the Public Works Department, the Unsung Heroes, the ones you call usually when you get a pothole in front of your house. The Public Works Department act as stewards of our beautiful city by helping to achieve the strategic goal of enhanced quality of life and safety for families, as well as providing effective, efficient, and aesthetically pleasing infrastructure through the ongoing maintenance of and improvements to our critical infrastructure. This department provides service to our community and organizations in five key functional areas, pavement management, stormwater management, beautification, facilities and fleet maintenance, and emergency management. Speaking of emergency management, our Public Works Department takes a leadership role in all four areas of the city's emergency management program. That includes mitigation, preparation, response, and recovery. It's the objective of these four mission areas to ensure that our community is ready before, during, and after a storm. During Hurricane Sally, our Public Works folks were on the, on the job 24-7 addressing serious flooding issues that took place from all the rain. A lot of people didn't see them but I did, wearing their yellow jackets with reflected tape on them so I didn't run them over my truck. IT, in 2021, the IT department continued to face many challenges as well as achieving many accomplishments to provide service excellence to our department and for our city. Even though it's not a, a listed uh, uh, responsibility, one of the ones that uh, our IT uh, department has done is really enhance our cybersecurity and protect this city from uh, malware and ransomware. So far, we've come at it things pretty well. With the assistance of our help desk technician and use of our ticketing software, processes that flow through the city regarding service requests, such as onboarding, termination, separation, general service requests, phone system support, and other IT related functions continue to be enhanced and streamlined. The city help desk ticket systems have become the department's best tool for monitoring and maintaining service levels. This year, IT handled over 1,100 help desk tickets in 2021, which is a 34% increase over previous years. This department tool is critical, providing excellent customer service and, uh, and also improved response time for service requests. One of the key accomplishments of our IT was the implementation in, in, in um, getting Compass running. And it was an arduous two-year two process. IT reminds, remains a vital role in this project and they've worked hard to sex, uh, successfully implement Compass into the city's information technology ecosystem. In fact, they yielded 102 help desk tickets on Compass since its inception. IT remains instrumental in making mobile computing and telework a viable option for our city employees. Maintaining access to city services and application for employees while off-site continues to be a top priority by this department. This is still a critical part in the way the city can conduct business during these uncertain times that we live in, as well as emergency situations like hurricanes. Our library continually updates and adjusts the library collection space and programs to provide the best possible experience for patrons as a vital cornerstone of the Destin community. In 2021, they saw many new technological items added to include a self-service kiosk that makes checking out materials, paying for copies and printouts more convenient, thus improving customer service and providing quick, accessible means for library patrons. Even with the pandemic, the Destin community enjoyed its library services. 
For example, 32% of Destin's population has library cards. Additionally, library physical and digital book circulation increased to 76,600 in fiscal year 2021, a 10% increase over previous years. Our park and recs department made significant improvements at the Nancy Weedenhammer, Nancy Weedenhammer Dog Park right outside with Destin Forward as a co-sponsor to include sod, mulch, and two uh, dog agility uh, items. Parks hosted a ribbon cutting, an official grand opening of uh, Captain Leonard Destin Park, and then a groundbreaking ceremony took place at the shore at Crystal Beach Park expansion that I spoke of earlier. The park department also has multiple projects underway as I speak, including the boardwalk improvement at the harbor, finishing the work at Clement Taylor Park, and keeping all our parks safe, clean, and well-maintained. These are critical milestones that continue to lay a strong foundation for our growing community by enhancing the quality of life for our families. For a city our size of 14,000, we have millions of dollars worth of Bayside and Gulf Front parks um, that uh, if it wasn't for grants and the hard work of the council and our staff, um, most communities like ours don't have anything remotely like that. If you've uh, Visit one of our green spaces or participate in one of our many recreational programs or attended one of our events, you have seen the positive impacts of our recreational department here in Destin. Sports tourism continues to grow in our area through the strong partnership with our renters to provide top-notch adult and youth tournaments. We hosted 12 tournaments in 2021, which brought over 100,000 visitors and participants to Morgan Sports Center. We replaced four scoreboards at Morgan's and in a partnership with Destin Water Users, Reclaim Water was added to the Destin Sports Complex, which staff is working with the Destin High School Athletic Department for field space. Flag football, which started in 2019, has been a huge success. This program doubled its participants with 224 players in 2021. Recreational staff worked year-round spearheading 261 programs throughout the year with nearly 30,000 participants. We love the engagement of our Destin seniors who stay active at Buck Destin Park. We know pickleball is very popular and we're looking for alternatives to provide more pickleball courts at Destin. Staff always tries to improve upon existing programs and the services that promote quality of health, connect the community, and impact the local economy in a prosperous way. But with that success also comes challenges. Our recreation amenities are at capacity and we're looking at alternatives of what we can do for our future to give our community the recreational experience they deserve. As I went through the updates of our many departments, you can see our biggest, most important resource is our employees. I'd like to acknowledge all of our hardworking staff who display the utmost professionalism and have built so many positive relationships in this community. You all are on the front lines every day as public servants which is more than just a job, it's a calling. Every day we see the results of their commitment to Destin by providing service excellence, not only for our residents, but for tourists as well. This city depends on you, and we greatly appreciate everything that you do. We have representatives of the Sheriff's Department. The next group of, of folks I'd like to recognize and thank are the men, women, and leadership of the Okaloosa County Sheriff's Office. These folks are true public servants. They're working long hours to include night weekends and holidays, and these dedicated professionals spend a great deal of time away from their families and risk their lives to protect ours. The Oakland County Sheriff's Office has implemented a community resource deputy specifically dedicated to Destin. This position will be a great access to our community to further develop strong bonds and a liaison with our local businesses and neighborhoods to address issues of concern and find solutions together. In 2021, the Sheriff's Office made 83 arrests for BUIs. For the third year in a row, Oklahoma County was ranked number one in the state for boating under the influence arrest. And due to the efforts of the Sheriff's Marine Unit and the FWC officers, they saw a significant de decrease in boating accidents from 25 boat crashes in 2020 to 14 in 2021. So your efforts have been well rewarded. This was attributed to targeted media, partnering with local businesses, including our livery vessel industry, to spread information about the dangers and consequences of BUI and participating in Operation Dry Waters and the designated skipper campaign. Another key component of public safety in Destin is the, <clears throat> excuse me, the Destin Fire Control District. 
The district just opened a new station off Calhoun Avenue in July to give us better coverage on the west end of our community, and which will house their newly purchased Engine 19 once it arrives. They secured several grants, and one being the Port Authority Grant, which provide the fire department with a 42-foot fire boat, which will enhance capabilities to handle any, uh, any fires or, or uh, um, rescues with a vast fishing fleet or large condos on the water here in our area. They also added a type one technical rescue team where they can handle all types of advanced rescues from confined space emergencies to building collapse rescues. They are the only team of this level north of Orlando that has this type of certification and training. So that's a pretty big honor. During the 2021 season, the Beach Safety Division aided with over 157,000 preventative acts, rescued 403 people, and responded to 67 major medical incidents. To our first responders, thank you for your devotion, bravery, service, and commitment to the safety of our city, our residents, as well as our visitors, not just today, but every day. Please join me in sharing your thanks and recognition to our outstanding city employees and first responders. Thank you. Destin's vision is strategic planning is a collaborative effort across our community. This is the opportunity for our businesses and our residents to work with city staff and our council members to shape the future of Destin. What's great about visioning and strategic planning is it gives us an opportunity to understand what the community needs. And we get to work together to accomplish that. To facilitate this, plan facilitate this planning, the Community Development Department is beginning a major public engagement effort to involve our citizens and community partners that will allow us to usher in a unified community, community development vision. And it's gonna to start tomorrow night. February 23rd at 5.30 will be our very first workshop, and I highly recommend and encourage all of you to attend. This is your city, and it's, and it's our city, and we, and we want to try to make it a better place every single day. The council and I highly recommend that you all attend and help shape the recommendations that will come before uh, council in the near future. Destin is led by a committed and volunteer council who generously give of their time because they are passionate about Destin. All of these men and women behind me work very hard. They work for free. They've been diligent investing in Destin's future by focusing on common goals and at times making difficult decisions on challenging issues. Our council seeks community input and gives our residents the opportunity to share how they want to see our city evolve in the years to come. It will take all of us to develop a great plan where future generations of Destin will continue to live, work, and play in the place that we love. During my tenure, my goal was to maintain the integrity and heritage that was, Destin was built upon and to achieve the objectives set within our strategic plan and also to have shorter meetings. We achieved that a couple times. In all seriousness, my main vision was maintained, and this is why I ran for mayor was to maintain the heritage of our city because if we ever lose our heritage, we're gonna lose our identity. Despite our beautiful beaches, shopping, recreational activities, and the tremendous growth we are experiencing in this great community, the heritage of Destin needs to remain above all. How it was founded, the fishermen and their families that made it grow, the integrity and hard work they imparted on generation after generation, is what separates us from every other community in the United States. And we need to hold on to that sentiment. We need to espouse and highlight these values as we move forward in everything we say and do. Don't be a negative Nancy. Be a positive go-getter and doer. Our heritage is what defines community, and it takes community to achieve our vision. The vision that you and this council and staff and myself have worked hard to create a family-oriented beach and fishing community where people want to live, work, and play, and where visitors are welcome to respectfully enjoy our community and its resources. It's been an honor to serve as your mayor. I'll forever be grateful for the trust you place in me. I'm thankful for the privilege to work with these fine men and women on issues facing this city every single day. And uh, I just want to say God bless all of you. And God bless the city of Destin, the luckiest fishing village in the world. Thank you.
approval. Roger. <laughs> All right. Well, I didn't have an approval to do that because we didn't do the agenda approval before we started. So that being said, let's retract our steps and I'll look for a motion. I'll make that motion. Second. I have a second. Let me get my little... Uh, Mr. Here. Mayor. Yes, sir. Um, could I request we pull item 3C from the agenda and we will bring it back hopefully at the next meeting? Item 3C. Okay, all right. Okay, any, I should have said before we got, went to a vote, I should have asked if anyone else had any other changes. Seeing none? What? Are we pulling 5C? Yeah, I would just note for the record that the applicant has requested that 5C be moved to a later date. All right, we'll start this over again I'm then. I'm sorry. Can I jump in for one second on 5C? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It's Kim, the city land use attorney. I just wanted to note that it needs to be continued to a time and date certain as discussed, which I believe is April 4th at 6 p.m. So 5C is being moved to April 4th at 6 p.m., Ms. Cop. That's correct. All right, well, before, uh, let's uh, redo our motion then. Um, so what we have now is we've pulled 3C and, uh, and we changed the date on 5C time certain to April 4th, 6 p.m. So I'll entertain a motion. I'll make that motion with those changes. Second. I have a motion, I have a second. Now you guys can hit the button. Eyes have it so moved. All right, we already got my long-winded presentation out of the way. I'll try to be quiet for the remainder of the day because I would still want to live up to my short meeting proposal and it's going to be difficult with all these red shirts in here tonight. Glad you're here, folks. All right, uh, 1B, Joe's Biorecreational Area Improvement Project Update from the DEP. Just hit the button. State your name. I always forget. You know, Will <laughs> Pierce Barrett, Department of Environmental Protection. And there's your flanker. My tool. Okay. Uh, Tallahassee, Florida. Glad to be here. I, I thought I was going to be turned around the other way after you had the podium set up. I said that'd be the first time I turned my back on a governmental entity when I'm making a presentation. <laughs> but it might be uh, safer that way. I don't know. <laughs> it could be. Could be. I mean, I, I, I give you credit for turning your back on your city council. <laughs> but anyway, I'm here tonight to give you an update on the Joe's Bayou. I know it's been a while, and you actually have some new council members that weren't on when this project was originally uh, brought to approval through the Deepwater Horizon program. This is a final restoration project, unlike the other projects we've done. One of them here in Destin, of course, Noriega Point, which is an early restoration project. But the funding all comes out of the Deep Horizon oil spill. Okay, I am not gonna read all the bullets on these slides. Unfortunately, my presentation tonight does not include a lot of nice pictures and plants and so forth, because we're not at that stage. This is just to give you an update of where are we now. The project was selected in 2016, and it went through the federal process of a lot of surveys. It took approximately about three, four years to get done. Then, of course, we advertised the project to the state's solicitation for professional engineering and architecture, and we selected uh, the team of Taylor Engineering, DAG Architects, and Half Engineering, and they went under contract in 2021. Since their contract has been initiated, we have done the following activities. Yep. Okay. Well, I'm going to describe, I guess I ought to describe the project first. And I will mess this up, so y'all have patience with me. I'm only an engineer, not a technician. Uh, this is a project that includes Joe's Bayou, the existing recreational area improvements, and then improvements to the Maddie Kelly Park, which is across the street from the Joe's Bayou recreation improvements. The project will include 
uh, access to the boat ramp, which is probably the number one improvement out there. And then we will also be replacing, repairing, et cetera, to the existing fishing pier. And then we will have development of the former. You just gonna mess me all <laughs> up. All right. I get it, I like to turn around. But anyway, uh, the existing fishing pier and then the former Simex site is also going to be redeveloped. Part of the project, what is included in it, and this was all set out in the project approval when it went through the approving process with the federal agencies and the states and so forth. But it was more states included than just Florida. We're gonna create a living shoreline with breakwaters. Uh, the stormwater pond is gonna be restored. The salt marsh and the uplands are gonna be restored. And when I say restored, things like invasive species, uh, drainage, etc., will be improved and uh, you know brought up to where they should be now. Enhancements and improvements to the kayak paddlecraft launch will be made, and then there will be rehabilitation and expansion to the existing parking, which I know is also extremely important. If you've been out there on a holiday weekend, there's nowhere to park. There will also include educational language signs and so forth that describe the, pro, uh, the wetland areas, what vegetation people are seeing and so forth. There'll be lighting improvements, typical landscaping, not exotic landscaping, but just, just landscaping to bring some of the areas that are bare up to uh, enjoyable uh, for people to view. There'll be benches and trash receptacles, of course. We're gonna upgrade the nature walk, which is uh, on the Maddie Kelly side. There will be replacement and repair of that nature walk. And enhance the wetland, that is remove invasive species. And then there'll be improvements to the restrooms or building a new restroom, depending on the amount of money available. And then everything we are doing out there will try to meet ADA accessibility. In some cases that practically can't be done, but in most cases we will. That's always the goal of all our projects. This is Maddie Kelly Park and Joe's Bayou in this picture right here. This is, uh, has some early descriptions of what was being planned for the project. Maddie Kelly Park, of course, is on the south side and then the Joe's Bayou Recreation and the Simex site are on the bay side. The funding, as I mentioned earlier, comes through the Deepwater Horizon oil spill. It's called the NERDA. Natural Resource Damage Assessment, Final Restoration Plan, <laughs> RP1. And the total amount allocated to the project is a little over $2.2 million. The project team, as I mentioned earlier, who our consultants were, but the total project team includes, of course, DEP. We're in charge of the funding and the overall project management. Then our consultants, uh, Taylor Engineering is the prime. They're in charge of engineering management and the coastal engineering portions of the project. DAG Architects will be the project architect in charge of the site planning. And then they've also, which I'll get to later in this presentation, the development of a website and a survey uh, that we're gonna release March the 1st. And half engineering is the project uh, civil engineer. Also on the team is uh, your destined staff. We will be meeting with them throughout the project, getting input from their staff. They will be reviewing the plans as we develop them and also in charge of the local permitting. Okay, we go back one, okay. On the project, where are we now? Uh, the project has finished all of what we call the initial groundwork to begin the planning and design for the project. We've completed all the surveys. When I say surveys now, I'm talking about like boundary surveys, topo surveys, bathymetric surveys, natural resource surveys. Those are all done. Uh, the geotechnical preliminary investigations have been done. They've done an existing structure assessment, which every structure out there from the parking lots to the boat ramps, to the restrooms, et cetera, have all been in the fishing piers, all that has been assessed to determine what's salvageable, so to speak, and what is gonna to have to be replaced and uh, demolished. The next uh, major thing we're going to do, as I said, is next week, and this is the uh, 
website I'm going to show you has been vetted through your uh, communications, Ms. Card, also through our DEP communications. And thanks to Ms. Card and her help, we will, she will put out press releases from the city and notify all the local communications like TVs and newspapers that this site is available. It'll be on the city's website, the link, not the website, but the link to get to the website will be on the city's uh, website. And that website includes a survey, which we hope we'll only have to put up for 30 days. If we get enough response within the 30 days, then we'll have enough information to help us assess our planning for the amenities that go into the uh, boat ramp. I mean, the whole park, I'm sorry. It's been a long day. We've got uh, also included will be next steps will be, of course, the conceptual plans. And at the point of the conceptual plans to develop, that's what we call 30% design. We intend to, um, it'll depend on how you'd like us to, we'll do a public workshop or forum or do it as a presentation at a regular council meeting. But that's at the time that, you know, people can actually see what this project is going to include, where it is and how the site will be laid out and then get further comment from the public and of course yourselves. And we'll also be presenting this to your Parks and Rec Committee, which we usually do before we bring it to you. Uh, the permits for this project are actually very detailed permits. We've got the FDEP and the Corps of Engineers Submerged Lands Permit. That permit will probably be uh, the most time consuming. Uh, we hope six months, it can't take a year. It will depend upon our cooperation with the federal entity. We've got an environmental resource permit, which is another name for basically the stormwater permit. And then we've got your local permits, development order and uh, building permit. Uh, we'll have to back up on my timeline. I said these activities, I was being optimistic, 2023, 23, 24 for release and start of construction. It will still, the project is still intended to be completed by the end of 2024. But it depends on permits. Permits move faster, we start construction faster. As I said, the website, release March 1st, public survey for 30 days, and the website itself will be up the entire duration of the project. That is, you can, you can come online to the project, see where the project is, see reports and plans as they're developed. Uh, that's everybody. The website will be something of this nature. The actual website uh, upload effective March 1st will be, will be on your Destin uh, website. This, let me skip that. Has anybody got any questions at this point? And I'll show you the website. <clears throat> All right, council members, well, you got a chance. Rodney, go ahead. Thank you, thank you, Mayor. Thanks, sir. Um, First question is, um, for some reason, I was thinking that this project, there was $4 million in neighborhood of $4 million dedicated to this project, and you said 2.2. Am I just mixing this up with another project? No, 10.2. I'm sorry? There's $10.2 million. Did I say 2.2? Then I apologize, but there's 10.2 million. Uh, there's 12.2 total dollars for the project. That includes administration of the project, design, permitting, et cetera. And then right now, at that budget, we have about 10.2 available for construction. And that is, this project includes the, the property where the concrete plant was that we purchased? Yes, sir. The Simex ago. plant, the old Simex plant property is included in the planning and design. So when will the our workshop, the public have their input of what they'd like to see that property transfer well, we'll to? Get, we'll get input through the survey, which will show you in just a second, which will help us make the plan, you know, start, excuse me, start the planning. Then about 60 days after we assess the survey, that is take all the data and see how it is. About 60 days after that, we'll have conceptual plans ready to do a workshop okay. on letting people come in like this and like we did on Noriega Point and have comments and ask questions and provide you know, input to the project. Okay, I know a lot of people want it park and a lot of people want it parking for the, the boat, boat line, so. Oh yeah, the, the parking, I, I think as soon as it warms up just a little bit more, even on weekdays, parking becomes stretched over there. It does. I've been out there many times. For 10 million, we should be able to give them a little bit of both. That's right, that's right, thank you, Mayor. 
That's all. Yeah, thank it, you. Give us some. You give us some money yourself. We'll build a deck instead of a uh, flat parking. There you go. <laughs> all right, Miss Aber. Thank you, Mayor. You kind of answered it when you said it was going to be set up sort of like how we did with the Noriega Point, getting that park all set up over there and getting the input from the, um, the citizens. So I'm glad to hear that you're going to offer that opportunity as well. So it's important that the citizens understand March 1st, go to our webpage, look at that link and start submitting your thoughts and ideas of what you want to see. Joe's Bayou, the CMEX plant, getting the parking done, and also the Madiket Kelly area and pier um, and that walking trail. So it will be up to the citizens to start putting ideas it on is. there. And, and we want them to take the survey. That kind of guides us in the direction we're going for the conceptual plans. Then, of course, after conceptual plans, there's other opportunities to come in, like I said, a workshop and, and provide more input. Like I preach, I think, every time I uh, get in front of a, a city council, county commission, governmental committee. We don't start changing things after about 60% design. It's just not possible. It throws everything out of whack. So you have that 30% where the major items are identified, and then at 60%, you see the how those items were addressed. The, that is the stuff that people bring to us. And then at 90%, sorry folks, you just pick your colors out now. Well, thank you. I appreciate that clarification. And again, it is important that, that the citizens realize you have a lot of input. Get on there, take that survey, and help us help the city get a really nice, you know, boat ramp, piers, get it all set up so it's a nice area. And, and just to be clear, the website, like I said, is up the entire duration of the project. So people can go to the website and they can input questions to us about what they're seeing on the website, about you know, designs they're looking at and any input they want to. There's always a continual time. There is a point we cut it off as far as changing things, but they'll be kept aware of where the project's moving, what's slowing it down, what's speeding it up throughout the process. That website's up and will be maintained in all the way through construction. So um, we're, we're looking forward to that being a useful tool. That's, that's something new now to the development of projects. There's also other times we'll bring the project to you in a formal council meeting like this at, at 60 percent of course and, and then later at 90 to show you where we are and give you updates on permits etc but it's always available to you and the public on this website yeah catherine will do a, a, a really good job of make sure the public knows that mr destin thank you mayor i didn't have any questions i just wanted to thank dep for their efforts to preserve destin history joe's bio was very historical uh, it was named after the last Native American that lived in Destin prior to the Civil War, Indian Joe. It was the site of uh, our crucial in the, in the Civil War skirmish that took part in Destin. It's been the traditional hurricane hole for the fleet during hurricanes. Joe's bio has been very important to Destin, and uh, without your participation, it's unlikely that we would be go forward, going forward, just like the uh, Leonard Destin Park and the preservation and armoring of Norega Point in the last 20 years. DP has really come through for us. Lance, thank you, Councilor. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Bear Mr. Barrett, for, for coming out. And I uh, appreciate you making the trip over here, as always. Um, I do want to encourage um, the folks here in the audience and the folks watching at home to please take a few minutes and do the survey because that information will help uh, um, lend itself to the final design. Um, also wanted to mention uh, about seven years ago, Pierce and I walked that property out there and kind of dreamed about what it could look like and and uh, there's some great ideas floating out there and I just wanted the public to understand that um, anytime you apply for grant money there are some strings attached to it so there are certain expectations um, that come along with the money um, so we have a lot of latitude but there are certain things that we have to include and I'm, like the the living shoreline and things like that which are a part of this grant funding and I think the, um, the DEP website um, kind of lists out what those requirements are if you want more information. It does. And you can always, as I said, my, uh, my name and our uh, public information person's name and numbers and email addresses are available. So anytime any of you or any citizen has a question and they want to send it to us, we'll be glad to answer it as quick as we can. You want to put the website up, man? Yeah. This is what we'll, you will see when you go to this website. And you can't, it's hard to read the writing, but it again describes the project. 
uh, tell us what the goals of the project are as far as, you know, what's our intent and, and what were the stipulations that this project, like Lance just said, had to have to get awarded a grant. This is some existing, current existing site photos. We were fortunate to have a drone available to us. <coughs> And that empty date slot will be filled in, uh, hopefully it will say March the 1st through, this is for the survey through uh, 30 days from that. Uh, if, if we don't get enough response, we of course would extend the survey, but I hope with yeah, everything. Survey, that yes, that will, will go on to the next slide. That, the survey link was, was what was a, a you know, HT, HTTP site. This is, this is the actual website that you'll see. You can see it's got things that will be filled in as the project moves across uh, the boat, so to speak, as to where the project is. So, you know, one day you want to see, well, where is, where is the engineers on this project? Well, it'll show you. They're in permitting. They're in 30% design. And then that'll be filled in as we move through. It'll show what the milestones that have been reached and describe what those milestones were. Like I said, the milestone right now would be that we've completed all the upfront surveys, assessments of the site, assessments of the facilities that are out there. Um, that's the milestone at this point, and the development of the website. So we're that, we're that far into the project, and now we'll begin. Once we get the survey back, it'll be about a 30-day lag and then 30 days to assess the results of the survey, then we'll move on to uh, the actual design. So there'll be, you know, not much seeing much over the next 60 days, but then after that it should pick up. Johnny. No, um, Bobby. Uh, so how many surveys are we looking for? If there's a, an exact number or just an average, what's like the threshold? We would like to see, I mean, this is just off the top of my head more or less but we'd like to see a hundred or more responses to the survey and it's very easy type survey you know you go through you either put your cursor on a, a dot and say that's what you are. some examples of questions on the survey how do you come to this how often do you go to the site mm -hmm. how do you get to the site bicycle boat and trailer etc mm -hmm. um, and then it ranks the things and it says what how do you rank these items as important to your visitations at the site? It also will ask, too, the personal question of, are you a resident of Okaloosa County or are you a resident of City of Destin? Yeah. We like to know. It's not we don't ask their <laughs> names. We just like to know, you know, how many people have Perfect. used it. I think that's important. It's your facility, mm -hmm. although you have a lot of visitors from out of town, out of state that come in and use that during the season. Awesome. And then second question being, if the city produces any kind of educational content on this, whether it's video or photos, is that something we can work together with to embed on this website to give a little bit less construction lingo and a little bit more personal touch to it? From just a explaining, has been my biggest learning lesson on up here has been the process and, you know, leveraging the confusion and what's happening and the process that needs to happen. Well, I hope we don't change the website now. It took a couple of months to develop it. And like I said, it was vetted <laughs> by Ms. Uh, Card. Man. So we feel we're in pretty good shape, plus DEP's communication. So hopefully it's, it'll be, you know, if there are complaints on it, we'll make adjustments. Yeah. I mean, not, not to change it. I mean, to embed something is just a copy and paste of a link. Yeah, and, and I'll have to get back to you on that question because yeah, I'll have to go back to how we you know, <laughs> developed or how it would be if, if something might just go on the Destin website or if you, you're talking about actually adding things to the to I'm, the project website. Yeah, I'm just talking about copying and pasting a embed code into the project of the of the website. It, it's just it's five seconds. Okay, you're you're getting me on my. I know, I know. <laughs> I can't talk. I can't talk engineer with you, but I, I can talk tech with I, you. I, I, you know, I, I was just build, curious if I'm that's possible. Thing, I don't know, I don't know if that's uh, normal as a as a thing. <laughs> if we could provide additional information, um, I would ask for Catherine. It. Yeah, I would. I would. I would suggest you talk. To I was saying if it was, it was legal first. If that's something that's yeah, even yeah, done. Get with Catherine. Yeah, I mean, you you read the goals down. I mean, that's a that's a blanket page and a half. Of stuff so you know to put video to it and get people really imagine imagining as you and Lance did walking the, the property I think that would help people as well okay well thank you all right mr. Bagby your last thank you uh, Lance could you have somebody produce 
once we have the website and we have the link to hand out to everybody that launches a boat at Joe's Bayou uh, something here. Oh, by the way, when you get done today, go home and take this uh, survey. And if you could put a sign on the walking path over at the park, all those people that walk their dogs over there, uh, and just, you know, let them know the change is coming and we would like your feedback on what change you want. And if you go to this link or go to the city of Destin website, boom, and they see that sign, they'll take a picture of it or whatever. I think that will more than get us our hundred responses that we need to get, uh, and to get the, the feedback primarily from the people that use those two facilities. That's that's what I'm concerned about. I mean, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Well, okay. thanks so much. Any further questions? Okay. Thank no. you. All right. Thanks for coming. Thank you. See you soon. Hopefully. <laughs> All righty then. So these are our Mardi Gras beads. Is that what this? Okay. I was wondering what the beads were for. I didn't know if y'all were going to use it to choke me or what. All right. Got that out of the way. Up next, public comments. Uh, just want to remind you that uh, these comments are things that are on the agenda or not on the agenda. If you got a beef or a idea or a project you want to speak about, you have three minutes. And if uh, we do have a couple public hearings, so if you have something uh, that is um, um, on that public hearing, this is not the time for you to speak. You'll be opportune, uh, uh, given an opportunity to speak during the public hearing on that particular subject. So we got a lot of folks here tonight. I'm going to hold everybody three minutes to the best of my ability. Uh, and uh, I'll just start at this side of the room and work that way tonight. Now, there's more of you over here. I'm going to work from here and that way. So first person, uh, don't be bashful. Come on up to the uh, microphone. State your name and your um, address and let her rip. And just, uh, I'll, I'll give, we got plenty of opportunity for everybody to speak. Mayor, Council, Kyron Marler, 616 2nd Street, Destin, Florida. And I've been in y'all's seats, so I know all about this stuff. I have three things, and uh, I'll bring them up, and then you can check with staff on one of them. The first one times in with exactly the improvements that Joe's Bayou. Uh, before I left Council, Mr. Burgess and I had worked on a plan to uh, have the intersection at Benning, um, 4th Street and 1st Street realigned. Um, I feel there's a serious uh, problem there. Uh, there's a, a line of sight view. Uh, if you're looking rubbernecking back toward first to make sure there's nobody coming, you miss looking at somebody coming across Benning and going down fourth. I, uh, Mr. Burgess, I had a plan that was brought before the council when I was still on the council. So uh, if you'll get with him on that, and I brought this up a couple of months ago, so I'd like to uh, re bring it up again and see if y'all would uh, agree with it. I'm afraid we're going to have another tragedy like we had at Maine and. Uh, and Kelly, because uh, I had asked that to be changed many, many years ago, and it never did get changed until after a tragedy. I don't want another tragedy like we've already had. Number two, um, I love the fact that we made uh, bigger speed humps. I actually, I don't love it. We made bigger speed humps on Beach Drive. Uh, we seem to have this tendency of uh, paving a road, then digging it back up and doing something else to it. Um, the subtleness was, was probably better than uh, what we have now. It looks to be, in my opinion, a little bit bigger than it was before. Uh, I realize you probably did it for the same reasons we had them up there before because of that curve and also the Joe's Bayou area. But I think it needs a little bit of a, uh, I don't know if you want to call it dumbing down or maybe a little, little bit lower. Uh, I know Mr. Uh, Braden had mentioned something about this uh, about the time we redid it. And the third thing I bring up is uh, FBL. Um, as everybody knows, they've going to increase their rates and uh, their rates and everything. And in my particular case, with my mom, uh, it went up fifty dollars the first time, and it went up one hundred and fifty-three dollars. This uh, this 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 bill, this is outrageous for especially for uh, people on limited incomes. And uh, I realize FPL has to do their thing, but I think they 
they're wrong in the way they're approaching it. I know the, uh, the Scambia County, Santa Rosa County, and I'm not sure about Okaloosa County, but um, and I know several other cities. I know Scambia County is looking at the same thing we looked at about doing our own uh, power. And uh, so I'd like to see something, if possible, uh, you know, get some more fact finding on that, or hopefully maybe the city will join the bandwagon on uh, uh, going back and getting the, the rates uh, double checked again by our, uh, by our legislature. And uh, the other one I'll bring up uh, when you get to Azalea and, uh, and uh, Airport Road uh, speed. Thank you. All right. Thank you, sir. Up next. Come on up. Don't just elbow your way up. Pretend it's roller hockey or roller ball or something. Hey, Mike, state your name and address, please. Mike Abadie, 530 Harbor Boulevard. Uh, the last meeting, I know Mr. Schmidt was talking about his, his uh, experience with the livery vessel application. I want to share my experience with you, which was all pretty good. Uh, last year, my application, I came up here and complained my application took 57 pages to do it, and it took me about three days to get everything signed and acknowledged. This year, November the 2nd, Officer Morales from Code Enforcement sent out the emails to all the livery vessel operators. I was out of town at a convention. I got back on Thursday morning. I went online to fill out my application. Understand, let me, let me kind of preface this with I was probably the first applicant to go online and, and do this. So if there were any glitches, they were going to show up in my application. So Thursday morning, I went to fill out my application. I could not access it. I called that afternoon. I called Officer Morales and explained it to him. He said he was going to look into it. Friday morning, Joey called me. He said, Mike, we had a little glitch. We got the text working on it. Should be corrected by the end of day to day. Saturday morning, I went back online. I was able to access the application. It took me about 15, 20 minutes. In contrast to the 57 pages the year before, I had to upload five pages of documents. It took me it took me longer to figure out how to do it because I'm not that computer literate, but in about 15, 20 minutes I had them all uploaded and I sent it off to through Compass to City Hall. Monday morning I got a call. Second little glitch was uh, they had failed whoever whoever put the application and had failed to put one of the sheets in into the in the application. So they so Joey called me and told me he said look we're gonna make it simple for you. We're going to email it to you, print it up, fill it out. It took me about two minutes. He said, come on down to City Hall. I came out, I brought it to City Hall. Uh, Officer Mercurio was waiting for me. He's a notary. It had to be notarized. So instead of me having to go run around town getting it notarized, they reached out and called me and said, hey, come bring it. We'll notarize it. I was at City Hall for about five minutes. Total process, travel time, everything took me about 30 minutes. I was treated professionally they treated they were professional they were courteous and they were respectful and my, my experience with the entire code enforcement staff was all positive and I got nothing but great things to say about the way they handled that situation and handled me I expect I, I had no problem with the low with the little glitches they fixed them immediately once they found them so by Monday morning my, my application was complete Two weeks later, uh, Officer Dwayne, I don't know his last name, but he came by and did a parking lot inspection, which, the, which is obviously part of what they still have to do. And that was, that was the end of that. And the only negative was that it took about two months for me to, 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 get, the, uh, to get the license. I don't know why it took quite so long, but it, it, it was a little long, but it was the first one. One other thing I want to mention is tomorrow morning at nine o'clock at the community center, I want to remind council, there's a there's a uh, water sports safety seminar. We'd like as many of you guys to attend as possible. We'll have the Coast Guard, Marine Patrol, uh, uh, the Sheriff's Office, and Code Enforcement will all be there. Y'all can come give your input or ask questions. Thanks, Thank sir. You. Appreciate it. Up next from this section. All right. No one else. Anybody over here in the middle would like to come up and speak? Come on up.
per our conversation, I'll allow you the 10 minutes. Yes. And then uh, I'll yeah. politely, when we get close to it, I'll ask you to wrap it up and then you just come back. How do I work from. this? I do have slides. <coughs> it is a presentation. I have slides. Matt, can you help around here? All right. Go ahead. Lisa Rockwell, 609 Second Avenue. Um, the photo up on the slide, that is the Destin Airport and the hashed black area that you can see, that's where the approved development that's going to be built. It's clearly encroaching on the runway and it's clearly a threat to the airport, which is also a threat to the quality of life of the citizens who are going to live there. So airports and residential homes, when you put them together, they always produce the cycle that you can see up on the slides. Homeowners tend to complain with the noise, which they put on political pressure. That leads to restrictions on the airport. Now it can sit at that phase for years with more noise happening from the airport and more homeowners complaining until it eventually moves on to airport closure. Um, this happened in Santa Monica, California. They're scheduled for closure. The East Hampton, Long Island airport, that is scheduled for closure in six days from now, on February 28th, all due to noise complaints from going through this cycle from homes being too close to the airport. Um, people say that it's never gonna happen here in Destin. They kind of shrug their shoulders and say, it's not a problem, we're not gonna close. But no airport is immune to this cycle that has residential development around it. Destin is currently in stage one and stage two of this cycle. The noise study that was done in 2008, that was a direct result of being in stage two. So whether we allow encroachment to continue or not, that's gonna determine whether we move on to stages three and four. Now our airport, airport generates over $144 million annually into Destin's economy. But it's proven with decades of data that the best way to cripple an airport is to allow residential encroachment to happen. And $144 million isn't a light amount of money to take for granted. So this is the noise exposure map that was generated from the study in 2008. You can see the homes in the northeast corner on the top of the slide in red. They, uh, they were identified to be, in the noise develop, to be in the newly developed noise zones, and they were recommended to be bought back by our local government. And we were eligible for federal financial assistance to make that happen. So they wanted them eliminated. The federal government has spent more than $1.2 billion as of several years ago to fund noise studies just like ours so that communities will know exactly not where to build homes. So this is our most, most current noise exposure map from 2013. The noise zones are clearly marked and the new developments down in the bottom right corner outlined in green. It's almost entirely within the noise sensitive area with over a third of the homes inside the incompatible noise zones. Now these noise zones, they're based on scientific decibel levels. Um, greater than 65 decibels, which is shown with that outer solid contour, that's where noise interferes with normal activities, such as speaking on the phone, having a conversation, watching TV. And this chart, um, this is what the data, the data for this is based for the federal, um, the federal land use compatibility chart. It shows the uses of land that are and are not compatible with airports. The intersection of the three red triangles, that's where residential meets with zones C and B that you just saw on the map before. At that intersection, there's an N and a one in parentheses in each box. That N means no, it's not compatible with airports. And if you look at the legend at the bottom outlined in purple, the N specifically says, um, that land uses and related structures are not compatible and should be prohibited. And the one, the note that's in there, refers to a much longer note that says, where residential uses must be allowed, sound level reduction should be, should be used. Effectiveness of sound level reduction is based on windows closed year round and sound level reduction will obviously not help outdoor noise problems. So even with the sound level reduction, it doesn't make these homes compatible. Now this is the currently approved plat for the development and you can barely see the dashed gray lines that mark the noise contours. So we've highlighted them in red. So that you can see them better. Every single home along that Western road violates the noise zones along with four more along the entrance. So in total, that's 33 lots 
that violate these noise zones, and seven of them are even within zone B. Now, back in January, the developer came before you and asked to squeeze 11 more homes along that western road, all in the noise zone. It would have put us at a total of 44 homes in the noise zones to be violated. So we thank you for denying the request, but we also need your continued support on this issue. Encroachment can work around airports, as long as it's compatible. You have commercial, agricultural, industrial, recreational, and recreational is what this was zoned until 2019, three years ago when it was rezoned back to residential. This was against the recommendations from the county. In the county's technical response memorandum, the recommendation stated, as proposed, the requested rezoning does not appear to provide a transition of uses compatible with the existing airport. Okaloosa County Airport System finds the application for rezoning incompatible with the airport's environs. And then they went, they went on to recommend some further planning and collaboration. Now, we also accept money from the federal government. The county does. Um, they've accepted over $4.9 million in federal funds since 2012 for two major projects. One was to lengthen the runway, and the other one was um, for, to construct the control tower. Both of these improvements are aimed at, getting, at attracting larger jets to come into Destin. And historically, the biggest complaint of residents who live near an airport are larger jets. So accepting these funds and building this development create a conflict of interest. Now, the airport sponsor, the county, they have to sign a contract with the federal government when they accept money, ensuring 39 different specific things to protect this federal investment. Number 21 on the list is specifically to prevent incompatible land uses around the airport. Now, this council asked me two weeks ago when I was here why, was, why I was here instead of the airport. So I reached out to the airport director and I found out why they haven't been here in front of the council opposing this development and the rezoning, fulfilling their responsibility for their federal agreement. And he told me that during the process, they actually received approval back from FAA saying that the FAA had no objections to any of this. So our representative in DC that we're working with right now on this topic contacted the FAA, but the only thing the FAA actually gave approval for was the review that ensures that tall structures um, won't be in the way of airborne aircraft. The FAA did not approve the residential development in the noise zones. So there's two separate federal regu regulations that govern development around airports. A Part 77 review, that ensures safe maneuvering of aircraft, and that's what the FAA approval was for. It was not for Part 150. For Part 150, there are no approvals. It's only enforced by withholding federal funds that violate their principles, such as building in the noise zones. The goal of Part 150 is to ensure that communities can coexist with their airports, so they don't want to shut them down in the long run due to noise complaints. So Part 77 is easy to see. It's something right now. It's a building that you're going to put in the way. It's an obvious conflict. But Part 150, noise, that's a lot less obvious. It takes a lot longer time to manifest and for people to see the conflict. And developers tend to mistake the Part 77 approval, and it allows them to say, hey, the FAA supports my development. What's the big deal? But it really is a big deal. Billions of dollars are spent to combat noise problems between airports and communities. At every level of government, there's offices that fight this. There are publications, manuals, congressional acts, all dedicated to this specific problem, and they all say the same thing. Don't allow residential development to encroach on your airport. It won't work out well. And restrictions at airports are mostly assumed to come from safety concerns. However, noise from airports is one of the most significant concerns relating to incompatibility, and it's often considered the primary factor that can impact airport operations. Now this is our airport coming in from the south, flying in over the beach. 300 feet to the right is where the golf course is, and that's where the development's gonna go in. We already have unacceptable encroachment on the west side, but they're twice the distance from the runway. 600 feet is close, 300 feet truly defies logic. I don't know of any other airport in the nation that has one that close. It's simply too close. So the mitigation strategies that we have for all of this, they're not gonna fix the problems that are gonna ensue. Sound level reduction only reduces noise. It doesn't eliminate it. And not being able to use your windows or use your yard, that's a serious quality of life concern, especially when we have an aircraft operation once every minute in the height of our summer season. Sound level reduction isn't even recognized by the federal government as justification to allow homes to be built inside the established noise zones. 
It's only intended to help pre-existing problems. As of October 1st of 1998, the federal policy is that no assistance will be given for homes built in the noise zones with or without sound level reduction. Van Nuys, California, they wanted to be able to build in the noise zones and mitigate it with sound level reduction, the same thing that we're doing now. And per their noise compatibility program, the answer back from the FAA was new non-compatible development within the 65 decibel contour, and that's zone C on our map, even with sound level attenuation, is inconsistent with the FAA's guidelines and 1998 policy and is approved or is disapproved for purposes of Part 150. So sound level reduction is not recognized as mitigation strategy, the way that we're trying to use it. Now the other two mitigation strategies that we have up there, this is a copy of the aircraft disclosure or the airport disclosure form. The bottom half here, this is all just signatures and there's truly only one line that's dedicated to notifying someone what they're getting into. It says the purchaser blank is hereby notified that this land lies within noise zone blank for the Destin airport and is subject to noise that may be objectionable. Now this is the only document that they truly get as a warning and it's not even required to be given to them until the day of closing. So they clearly don't get much warning what they're actually getting into. And the final mitigation strategy that we have, that's the homeowner's covenants and restrictions. It doesn't do a whole lot more um, than what I just described to you in the airport disclosure statement. It's basically what's written in there is nothing more than a liability statement to keep the county from being sued in the future if people have health issues from fumes, vibrations, sleep deprivation, whatever they may want to claim. And it certainly doesn't stop anyone from complaining. Can you wrap it up, ma'am? Yes. You're way past your time. Thanks. Well, Appreciate it very much. I'll and just end it there then. We request that this encroachment stops. Thank you. Thank you. We all take a seat, please. <laughs> Anyone else? Public comment? Seeing none, I'm going to go ahead and close public comment. I do want to remind everyone in the room, if you don't leave, that uh, at the end of tonight's meeting, there will be another opportunity for uh, public comment. So you get two shots at the apple here. All righty, let's, uh, let's go. Uh, number three is uh, our consent agenda. I'll entertain a motion I'll at this I'll make that time. motion to approve. I have a motion. Second. And I have a second. Any conversation? Seeing none. Thank you all for attending. Thank you. Still waiting. Bobby, Rodney, there you go. Eyes have it so moved. Uh, city manager, take it away. Thanks, sir. Um, item 4A, um, back in March of 2021, Council voted seven to zero to replace the transportation concurrency MMTD with the mobility fee-based plan, and that passed seven to zero. The purpose of this mobility plan is uh, to establish the long-term needs for the transportation network to facilitate the safe and effective movement of people to and around the city. Lance, of could you hold on a minute? I I can't hear you, and I'm right here. I should have waited. I, I apologize, Lance. All righty, Sheriff, close the door. Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Lance. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. All right. Um, what we have is our um, contractor is here this evening to um, give you an update on this plan, and Mr. Alan Steinbeck is here, and we'll, we'll take it from here. Thank you, thanks for having me tonight. I wanna to give you an update on our plan here. I'm the project manager of this. Uh, the purpose of this study on slide two is to establish the long-term needs for the transportation network to facilitate the safe and effective movement of people to and around the city of Destin. Next. Destin, our vision for the project, Destin will be a well-designed community where transportation system supports and enhances the living, working, and visitation experience. So we have these two overarching goals for the plan and we're now getting into the meat of our topic areas here. We've broken down this plan into five topic areas that include roadway level of service, the multimodal network, safety, 
the future of transit and placemaking and quality of life. And what I'm going to do for you tonight is to go over some of the findings for each of these and to sort of give you a heads up of where this is heading as we move into the next phase of work. So for roadway level of service, as a reminder, as we move towards the mobility fee structure from the MMTD structure, we will be having an adopted roadway level of service for the city. So it's important that we do this work now to set the standard, uh, the basis for that decision that you all will make. Uh, we've had in US 98 in particular, a plateau of volumes over the past few years, followed by a little bit of growth in the volume on US 98 in, in the past year or two. The planned network that you have really needs to be completed. We've, the findings have shown that making um, new city roads that parallel 98 are important and making new connections will have a lot of benefits. And we're finding some places where intersections and other improvements can impact operations. So some little improvements can also make a difference. I'm showing you now this slide of the volume to capacity ratio on US 98 for the segments um, starting in the, in the Harbor District at the top and going down to East Destin at the bottom. And what I want you to really see here, the takeaway from this, is when we were looking at 2011, um, a volume to capacity ratio of one means all the capacity has been used up, 100% of the capacity. So theoretically, 10 years ago, we were using up all the capacity of this road. And we're here today looking at the same situation where all the capacity is used up. And probably 10 years from now, someone else will be doing that too, uh, because the road's just going to be utilized to its maximum extent, um, kind of no matter what you do. Uh, so our goal here is to um, do what we can in lieu of anything that might happen on US 98 that the city has control of in this plan that we can make, do to improve it. Next. Um, we did an assessment of the level of service for the peak hour in the peak season of our collector segments. So um, Commons Drive is notably operating at a level of service D in the worst condition of the year. You all experience that. Using it, it can get a little troublesome, but it is, it is doing its job in terms of providing um, facility for, for locals in particular who know about it um, to be able to get around town in the area east of Airport Road. Next. And then looking back at US 98, you can see that um, uh, the, the facility operates at a level of service D east of Airport Road and west of Airport Road where it goes down to four lanes. You're looking at uh, one segment that fails and others that operate at an E or D level of service in traffic engineering terms. Um, and this is again at the peak, the peak season of the year. Next slide. We've mapped these things. Our plan will have a series of maps that will show this data in a way that you can visualize it spatially and help you really not look at a bunch of numbers. So we've started creating these now. And this shows what I was just showing you, those segments west of airport, uh, where the purple one is the worst one immediately west of airport in terms of US 98's function. And you can see that yellow level of service. See, so you can visualize really that all the collectors are um, mostly operating at a pretty good level of service. Next. So for multimodal facilities, um, essentially the goals of the comprehensive plan have been met. There were goals set a long time ago about level of service for, for bikes and pedestrians in particular. Um, the network is not complete though. There's still some gaps, even though the city has made some efforts to complete a network around the city. There's still some work to do. I'll show you that in a second. Um, our plans definitely need updating, having not been updated for many years. Um, the needs for bike and ped are being established in this plan. And we have a renewed, focus on neighborhood issues and how to resolve some of the, the lacking areas in neighborhoods in particular. Next one. So we've done the uh, multimodal level of service calculation. This is like a roadway level of service calculation, but it's got its own methodology that relates to whether there is a bike lane or sidewalk present, where that sidewalk is or bike lane is relative to traffic, is the sidewalk set back or not, and then how much volume is there, is there on the road or the main characteristics. Also, um, pavement condition for bicycles is important too. And you can see that the, in the comp plan, you had adopted goals to increase the level of service up to a level of service B for bicycles and pedestrians. And you almost made that, it's like you have a kind of a C plus, according to the numbers um, of having achieved that through the addition of bike lanes and sidewalks and trails throughout the city. So that's what I say when I mean the goal has been met. The transit goal was set for C at this time. The transit goal has not been met because there's not been an appreciable increase in transit service um, over the time at the, of the, from the adoption of the comp plan. Next, that was the collectors. This is Highway 98. And um, you can see there that the level of service established for bicycle and pedestrian by 2021, the 
uh, the 2020, the 2021 assessment that we just did resulted in the finding that um, you are meeting the, shrimp, the bicycle level of service out there and the pedestrian level of service at for D for that facility. Next. We went back and looked at some of the historical um, construction of, of facilities in the city, looking at sidewalk bicycle lanes and multi-use trails, the number of feet that were constructed. And you can see that um, over 11 miles of sidewalk have been constructed in the past 15 years. Over 15 miles of multi-use trails have been constructed. Next slide. But you can see that that same data, you can visualize there was a, a push in 2007 through 2011 to build trails. Um, and that was immediately following the, the institution of the Multimodal Transportation District, a firm commitment on the part of the city to do that. Um, and, and after that period, there was the great financial crisis, the outfall from that and the budgetary concerns around that, and also a move towards putting transportation money into resurfacing projects rather than these. But I think what we'll find is um, there's a lot of need out there and um, still some work to do. If you go to the next slide. Uh, we have identified the gaps that still exist. So we've taken a recent assessment of where there are sidewalk gaps in the network. Um, some of these were, were by, um, on purpose, by, by decisions that were made, but others are just places where we might need to have new sidewalk facilities out there. And this represents over eight miles of, of potential improvements that could be made still uh, from where we are today. Next. So safety has been a key issue for this. I know that it's an important issue to the city. A lot of people are talking about this right now. So we wanted to really dive into this a little deeper. Um, US 98 has lots of conflicts between modes that we're looking at. The neighborhood issues are a little nuanced in that they relate to speed design and the availability of facilities in some cases. But we really want to have a data-driven assessment that allows us to look at the current situation and track progress over time and make sure that we're really addressing this uh, situation. So if you look at the next slide, we have taken some Florida Department of Transportation data. They maintain a very good database of safety concerns. Uh, this is the period from 2017 to 2021. And this is an example of some of that data where we can see where there have been fatalities, where there have been um, injuries, and where there's um, other types of crashes around Destin. And you're really running out of pace of it looks like more than two fatalities per year, uh, which is kind of a lot for a community of your size. Um, and of course, any fatality is, is a tragedy out on the, out on the roadways, uh, but we, we now can identify them and try to see if there's something that, we, that maybe in, from a safety perspective can be addressed in the plan. The next slide. We also know uh, where all of the crashes are in terms of whether they're vehicle involved, bicycles or pedestrians. And this comes out with a little bit of a story about a number of bicycle crashes that are in the Harbor District, where a lot of the employees of the um, restaurants and hotels ride their bikes to work and they're up against um, some, some significant traffic. So we suspect that that's what's going on in that area. And then down in the area of, um, from Big Kahuna down to um, Chick-fil-A, there's also a lot of people crossing the street and some pedestrian crashes that occur in that location. And the data is sort of telling us that story. So we can use this to go out there and look to see if there's some solutions that we can put in place that can improve these situations. Next. Uh, that, the, the time of day crashes, um, we looked at these. Uh, one thing to note is that crashes in general, the, each little bar is the time of day and the years go, um, each of the years is shown from 2017 to 2021. Crashes have been going down. Um, they, they may have gone down a little bit during COVID, but they've gone down faster than COVID would, would indicate. Uh, but this slide is showing us that really the time of day um, uh, crash is there in the, um, in the peak period of the early evening. Next one, um, alcohol-related crashes by time of day. A lot of people think that a lot of these occur late at night, and many of them do, but actually a lot of them occur between 6 and 7 p.m. Um, when people have started in on their afternoon drinking and get behind the wheel. Um, so that it is it's just interesting to me to see that that is a time of day where that happens a lot. At happy hour, yes, happy hour is um, after happy hour. Correct. Yes, um, the safest time to drive in Destin is 6 a.m. in the morning, just in case, you, if, in case you were wondering. Um, the uh, next slide, please. And then crashes involving distracted drivers where you have uh, early afternoon people distracted, which one theory is that that's when the high school lets out and that's when <laughs> kids are driving around looking at their phone. I cannot prove that, but um, that's the, what's out there. Yes, but the, again, those have also go down, gone down a 
considerably since 2017. And I think that's a matter of awareness and people taking it more seriously and kind of knowing that there's a problem. So next one. On the future of transit, there are, um, again, I mentioned the goals are not met from the comprehensive plan. I mentioned that before. Uh, the existing transit system has really not been expanded in a long time and it's actually underperforming like many transit systems are today. There's new types of service and technology for on-demand transit private services um, that are out there that are sort of changing the nature of the business, if you will. Um, and uh, we really want to look to some of that for the future of Destin. The, uh, the idea back when the conference plan was adopted was that there was going to be some mode shift to transit which would alleviate some of the congestion in the city and that did not happen. We didn't see that happen at all. If you look at the next slide, um, it's just that here's an example of our existing condition service where we have a, three transit lines that run in Destin, two that connect in the middle and one that provides a, a citywide circular function. Um, and there are some recent plans updated uh, TDP being proposed, which is the transit development plan um, that I think we should all kind of dig into and see what's being proposed to, um, uh, that may change here, but that's a little bit beyond the scope of tonight's meeting. The next slide. You can see what I was talking about. The ridership has gone down a lot for fixed route service shown in blue uh, from a few years ago at over 180,000 trips down to 60,000 trips now. So it's really taken a nosedive, a faster nosedive than many other transit systems, which have seen something similar, but just not to this degree. Um, so we're, we're, our service is definitely underperforming at this point. Next. In conjunction with um, transit, we want to look at uh, parking areas and uh, where people park. Um, the improving the Seabird Avenue parking lots, making the Marlboro Street parking lot a hub for transportation where one can park and walk, possibly making that a structured parking deck. So that is part of the project. Next slide. And on the eastern end of town um, in Crystal Beach, we want to try to find a place to park. I know some ideas have been considered in the past, but um, we're trying to find a situation that provides more park and walk and more destination oriented parking in that area. Um, and then uh, the Destin Commons is shown because that's the current transit hub that exists now. Next. And the last topic here, place making quality of life. You're really moving from a suburban model of development to infill and retrofitting. And you see that in the residential projects that come through here, um, love them or not, they are in a, in a model that really is about infill development and that level of intensity and retrofitting places to work so that um, you can kind of mix people living with some of the commercial development that's here now. That means the potential for shifting modes of transportation and redu reducing trips and actually having more people walk around Destin, which is kind of a good thing. Um, but it has a negative impact sometimes on parking demand and kind of puts an intensity of development that needs to be managed appropriately. Um, and lastly, we really, in terms of quality of life, we very much want to meet the transportation needs of residents and visitors and think about um, each of those groups and, and how to appropriately um, address their transportation needs. So I wanted to show this, the, um, from 2009 to 2019, the population of Destin has grown, shown in blue. Uh, we've done an estimate of, of seasonal population, and these are people that would claim that um, they live here part of the time or their property owners who own a property and may sometimes rent it out. Uh, but you have uh, um, a permanent population plus a seasonal population of over um, 26,000 people at this point. And um, what's interesting is the seasonal population estimate is a representation of the number of units which are, which are not permanently <coughs> occupied. So they may be renting them out and, and actually, of course, more people are showing up. This does not include the visitation population, for example. Next slide. We've uh, worked with the, um, the planning division on um, understanding the planning areas of this. So we'll have information summarized by planning areas and we intend to try to equitably distribute some of the investments and spending and priorities throughout the city so that each area is served in its own way. And the next slide. We've done some forecast of um, population, housing, employment for each of these areas. And the next slide will show you uh, the relative intensity of those things looking at some increased har um, employment in the Harbor District and Town Center, and then some residential um, additional development sprinkled around the city here. Next slide. So where we are, um, we've completed the trends and conditions work in terms of the analysis. We're now documenting that. Part of what you've seen tonight is, is that effort um, evaluating what's going on and assessing level and quality of service. Uh, we've also inventoried current and planned projects. So 
there's three ways we're going to get new projects from on the books that are already on some of the plans that we know need to be done from the, the team that we have to identify projects that um, we, we that come out of the analysis process and then the feedback that we get from people in the community so we're hoping that um, tomorrow night for example the uh, meeting you mentioned mayor we have people who can come out and mention transportation needs that are in the city and we can do that in addition to the survey next slide please uh, we've already started the team has already started identifying draft projects so in addition to assessing what's on the books and the plans we've started to look at those sidewalk gaps and do some other um, needs identification next and then evaluation of benefits will will be testing out these scenarios of, of improvements to see what are we getting out of it in terms of um, measurable benefits and safety improvements and that sort of thing so that's kind of where we are on the project I do look forward to tomorrow night we have an engagement survey which is on the next slide anyone who wants to take this survey can go to menti.com and enter this code or use this QR code you can do that at your own speed at your own time this is the survey that we will be doing tomorrow night so we'll have the live action of it and um, you'll be able to see the results uh, but we do want as many people to engage with this as possible we have um, over 87 people uh, 80, 80 to 90 people actually who've engaged with it already because it's been published and put out in the street um, and we hope to get about 200 or more back from this um, I did want to take the time to show you all kind of how it works tonight so we've got a short much much shortened version of it um, through Mentimeter that we're gonna bring up and try to make a live action happen here so you'll need your device um, ready on the ready if you have it um, if you've already filled this out you may have some trouble because it recognizes you as a previous submitter of this thing um, well not here that'll happen tomorrow night um, this is all brand new so if you'll go to minty.com and anybody can do this this these are unofficial results uh, all the official stuff's going to happen tonight and on on people's own time but this is just a demonstration so anyone who wants to do this is fine once you get there, you enter the code number, 49040803. And Council Member Abra, you're, you're my beta test run. Once you're ready, we're ready. So you, you to yes, I do, I do, yes, correct. Mm -hmm. You can do the QR code if you can. Yeah, if you can see it. On. All right, you can go to the next slide, which should bring you up to the. Yes. We're going to present. Yes, yes, so this is an example of um, some of the feedback we're going to get. Um, we've gotten a lot of words on there. Um, crowded is a very popular answer uh, with people. Um, but this just demonstrates how this works. The more people who say something, the bigger the text is. So when we get a big group, we'll have a lot of words up here. And I'm going to move fast. I'm sorry if we cut some people off in the interim time. I want to show how this show you how it works um, and get a sense of it so yes a crowded um, very well developed beautiful paradise seems to be the winning um, phrase so far Yeah, so you can, people can say more than one thing. Yes, yeah, so we can go to the next, the presenter, you can go to the next question. We're going to keep going. Then how strongly do you agree or disagree with this statement? And this is, uh, Destin is a very well-rounded community with what is needed to support a high quality of life. So we have these value statements that help us understand if people are actually believing that Destin has these features. What? Yes. Mm-hmm. Well, it does show us, um, you know, every user has their own distinct profile or, you know, it's anonymous, 
but we know the answers that are given by everyone. So you have like a record that's in there in the, in the recording. And this shows us that people, the little curve in the back were skewed towards positive positivity here on this one. Um, and we're at above average here. So we'll go to the next slide just to keep this moving. And then what are Destin's strongest quality of life attributes? Um, in the meeting itself tomorrow, we'll be having people put this in, give live responses, and we'll sort of be speaking them back to the group to hear what what people have to say. And all this will be, all the results will be available. Yes. Mm hmm Yes. Right, right. We're ready to move on. Yep, so presenter, if you'll advance. So we want to know if people are doing this just for recreation, not doing it at all, or doing it to actually get somewhere in terms of... I bet. Yep. So it's fun to watch the results come in, especially with a big crowd. They really start to pour in pretty fast. All right, next one. Let's just keep going. Next. Rank the following transportation emphasis areas of, in order of importance to you. So this is a chance for people to say, you know, what they feel like um, is the most important in, in one, two, three, four, five, in terms of these topics. And traffic flow is a very popular answer, yes. Um, we've already seen some of the preliminary results and that one is, is doing quite well. Safety as well. What it it is it is it's very um it is the immediate interactive part of it is I hit I hit enter on my thing and it was like bloop like the whole thing changed you know what I mean yeah. it's small you know right right that's pretty cool yeah it is fun so then after okay. that when we go to next one yeah, hundred dollars we're, we're almost done here too okay so if if you and this is one where we're asking people across different topics. Um, so because we're um, working on some different topics for improvements, especially with the impact fee study work that we're doing, um, we have transportation, parks and rec, library mixed in um, to see relative to transportation and what would other people want to be investing in for some other important facilities in the community. And again, Parks and Rec, um, is, we're getting some very popular response to that one, I, for sure. I would yes. put 50 of my $100 on Parks and Rec. <laughs> right. Well, then, the other 10, I had to put some to the library. Yeah. Did you not know the other answers to choose? Do you try and tell me, don't complete it, because this is kind of long, isn't it? And we do. I found in surveys that after about 10 questions, people you stop. Say, yeah. the hell with it. We well, know, this is what six questions exactly. now, right? This is six, right? So you can imagine doing the, the 30 that we have. And it does say on the bottom right of the slide how many people have completed it. So we do have a record of how many people drop off. Um, so we, we will know, and we'll know who those What's our incompletion are. rate so far? It is the incompletion rate. The incompletion rate is about 25%. So not, not too bad, honestly. Uh, but even though, even among those twenty-five percent, though, some of them get get much of the way through it, and then say whatever it was you would, the heck with it, or the hell with it, yeah. Um, so not everyone's going to finish the survey, but that's okay. All right, so that's that's the demonstration. So we hope that um, everyone can do that at home on their own time. There's the full survey, which this is an example of, or really come join us tomorrow night, where we want to talk to the people of the community. I will be here and the planning staff will be here as well. I have a meeting at 5.30 tomorrow yeah. night. I'm already predisposed, but I'm- Rodney, I, I had good. you up there. Do you have a question? Pretty good. Thank you. All right. A couple of questions. When was the 2021 uh, survey, the volume to capacity? When in 2021? That was in, that was taken from numbers that were collected in July of 2021. Okay, I so was that the, was before it was six lane. On 98. That was after they had opened. The, the, that was after. They may have opened the the part down by Henderson, but they mm -hmm. hadn't opened the the eastern end. The eastern end. Yeah. So my because my question is, 
you're going to see a drop off in both of those mm -hmm. most likely uh, as far as level of service or actually you'll see an improvement not a drop off uh, I'll ask the staff what happened to the construction starting in 2013 I think I know how much is in the budget this year for sidewalks how many linear feet anybody know Public Works Public Safety Committee going to bring that back to us yeah I'm, I can I can get those numbers for you all I think in that spreadsheet I looked at today it was around 60 thousand for sidewalks okay just curious how many linear feet that is well you know some sidewalks are 10 feet wide eight feet wide four feet wide so it varies okay uh, and then the growth forecast slide that's trips that's not because you have single-family multi-family those are trips associated with those increases right those are actual people or units depending on the the one that's at the very end of the presentation that talks about the growth yeah. itself yes that those makes are, sense to me those are Crystal from beaches exploding from, yeah, that, yeah that doesn't make sense to me because you have the town center I mean, mm -hmm. I know we're going to put some townhouses and stuff in town center, but okay, I'll, I'll well, talk well, to we can revisit it. I'll look at that again, but it Do is, it. it's, it's incremental growth from today. Done, to Jim. You got another yeah. question? Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Uh, Dustin. Um, most of this is very good. Very interesting. I have one question. I noticed the segment from the, the bridge back to Benning or even to beach was rated a brown color, which is considerably better than the purple and some of those other, you know, less good, but that actually is the area that turns into a parking lot during most afternoons. How does that how does that anomaly come about? You know, it the anomaly of what the data is telling us versus reality. You're saying yes, yeah. and, and it's also the area of the most fatalities. It looked like mm -hmm. so. I would think that should be purple, also, but it's not. Is that a glitch? It's not a glitch. The 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 counters count how many people actually managed to get through it. Right. So once you reach a certain level of of um, boogered upness, which we say where I come from, like, <laughs> Good like term. only so many only so many cars can get through. So you can't really ex you can't really exceed your capacity. It kind of you have a upset limit of capacity. So if it's not processing traffic, then that counter sitting there doesn't know. Yeah. So no. there's there's some things that happen like that. Yes. Yeah, I, I get that. But of course, that's not a true reflection of where the awful problems are. Mm -hmm. The other question I have is, and, and and I've talked to Lewis this about a number of times, this is all great and we're going to come up with some really solu good solutions. Do you guys participate in where we get the money, the fees, the level, because obviously we're down we're around zero. You give a re After we go through all this, you give a recommendation on that also? Yes, we will. In fact, part of the part of this work is to be the legal basis for an updated impact fee for So you're going to have a number yes. for us toward the end. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dustin. Mr. Braden. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> um, my thoughts are, if if you were paying attention to this whole thing, the the first part of it was was for the city of Dustin was horrible at best and and it's things that we've known for years but we have approved roughly 800 apartments and townhomes in the last two years knowing a lot of this information that we've heard tonight we've we ha we have had a lot of pontoon boats in the harbor and we went to great lengths to try to get that under control. But in my opinion, we have done absolutely nothing to address this problem that we've known for years and years. I mean, am I wrong? I mean, I mean what? But we've, the roads have been in an F forever and the Crosstown Connector has been in the process for, for years, but that's not gonna solve the problem. I mean, all, all of our roads are, are, are horrible. But we, we've got over 800, almost 800 apartments, if not more, that we've approved in the last two years, and we've done nothing to, for our roads, infrastructure. I mean, the, yeah, but the numbers don't lie, Jim. They're still horrible. It's horrible. People are dying. The man just sat there and said that it's horrible. I mean, there's more people dying in our town than there should be, and it's, 
I mean, the number and the data don't lie. We need to, I mean, like I said, we got a lot of pontoon boats and we went to great extents to try to get that under control. We need to do something to address these problems, I believe. So that's all I have. Both which are mostly out of our control. We've got a comp plan and a land development code that has density numbers that are absolutely crazy. They are what we inherited from 10 years ago from the folks that were in charge. That's a big problem, and it takes longer to fix that than the pontoon. And the other thing is the state of Florida has made it quite clear that they don't want us to stop growth in any manner. Uh, thank God pontoon boats so far haven't been subject to Bert Harris law, but townhouses and houses and apartments are. So, you know, we're struggling toward it, but our, we're, we're, we're in a, a bag race with arms tied behind us hopping on one leg mm -hmm. due to both of those problems. But you're right, and I hope that we can continue to move forward to try to address it. And I, I would agree with Mr. Destin. I, the thing I would point out, though, is uh, the numbers you say for a town this size, but if you go to similarly situated resort communities where people don't know the roads, don't know the signage, don't know where they're going, you, you will find the same level you go down to Naples or you go down to Siesta Key, it's the same thing. Why? Because you got a bunch of people on their phone using it as a map or trying to communicate and you look at the distracted driving uh, accidents or whatever. It, that's what you have in a tourist destination. You have people not paying attention, running across roads that they have. No, now part of that's us. We should improve, you know, I'll make the tunnel pitch again thank you yes but uh, so it's I think we do what we can do the six laning improved it I think the crosstown connector why that got held up for so long you know that that's up here that's you know it should have been done a long time ago. all right thanks all right guys let's just uh, thank you so much for your presentation you. and yes. uh, see you tomorrow yes and um, uh, like like Mr. Bagby said let's just uh, work on what we can do and not belay the unfortunate things we can't do. We do live in the United States, a constitutional republic, and we do have to remind ourselves of that from time to time when you're being a legislator. All right. Thank you, sir. Yes. Appreciate it very much. And long may it live. Yes. All right. Thank you. Yeah, we don't live in Canada. <laughs> All right. My Canadian friends are calling me asking if there's any property available down here to uh, develop. There you go. Hey. Let me tell you what, if you live somewhere that's nice, where people want to be, it comes with it, baby. I mean, just drive through Atlanta at 3 o'clock if you don't believe me. Um, let's move on. Uh, we got a long ways to go. Let me tell you what. Let's see what time is it. Just keep going. Yeah, well, my bladder says otherwise. So let's take a five-minute break. <laughs>
Lance, operations financial report. Is that up next? Um, I think I have one more under city manager under 4B. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, yeah hold on, you got more than that. You got two. Yeah, we're at 4B now, go ahead. All right, sir, thank you. Um, 4B is regarding the facility and needs assessment RFP 2-11-PS um, that was uh, soliciting, soliciting responses. We got four responses back um, and staff is seeking council's uh, permission for me to engage in negotiations um, with the top um, design firm, which was Matrix um, and or if that does not work out with the runner up. Um, there are several components involved that we want to get out of this study. First off and foremost is our R&R fund, which used to be um, in the neighborhood of $45,000 a year, which is unrealistic for uh, maintaining a city our size. Um, we have since, um, due to um, council's understanding, um, gotten that uh, fund up to a level where we can start to really maintain things, but we need the justification out of this study to make sure that the numbers we're putting in are justified. So that would be part one. Um, we also, this, if we can, I would like to negotiate with them to uh, help us um, with a needs assessment that uh, would predict when our facilities have outlived their useful life and when we need to start looking at new facilities to replace them. Um, and on top of that, two, two smaller items are in, compl in comp they're compatible with those items is the ADA compliance of those facilities to make sure that we're um, bringing them all up to ADA standards as quickly as we can. And finally, um, for base data for the fixed management access um, program, and I will defer to um, either Michael or Crystal if you have questions on that one, because that one's a little out of my league. Mr. Bagby. I move that the city manager enter negotiations with Matrix Design Group Incorporated, report back to the council with the contract to consider. In the event that negotiations are unsuccessful, staff should enter negotiations with the second highest ranked vendor and bring back to the council a contract to consider. Second. I have a motion, I have a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none. Eyes have it so moved. Thank Lance. you, Mayor and Council. Um, just a couple quick announcements, and we've covered these already briefly, but I do want to reinforce them, um, that if you are available to come to the workshop tomorrow in this room and be a part of that, that would be a, a big help to our future. Likewise, um, when the survey goes online, and I believe it was March 1st for the Joe's Bayou Recreation Area Survey, I would strongly encourage all of you and all, all of you watching online to please take that survey so we can have as much input into that as we can. Thanks, I got sir. one, we got one quick thing. Go ahead. <clears throat> as far as that survey goes, I know there was a, uh, there was an FWC survey going around. I didn't have any idea about it. I don't think many people did <clears throat> and there was a handful of charter captains that were carrying the flyer around with them that's got a qr code and saying hey if you get a second tell us about how sharks have ruined your fishing trip you know is there a way that we can get a flyer have it put on the you know around town where people who you know tackle stores or whoever okay sorry i think jim had a great idea earlier <laughs> And seeing uh, you're on the uh, issue of shark uh, predation, I am going to six, April 4th sitting on a uh, National Marine Fisheries Council on dealing with that. So uh, the sharks. you're going to kill two birds with one stone with your recommendation in support of Mr. Bagby and bringing up sharks to me. Thank you. <laughs> All right. One item I did fail to mention, and uh, uh, sorry, Rodney, but... I meant to mention this is that the median beautification project should kick off tomorrow, hopefully with a little bit of luck. So hopefully we'll start to see some improvements between airport road and the bridge and our medians out there. Thank you, sir. All righty, Kyle, take it away. 
All right, first we have item 5A. This is the second reading of ordinance number 2204CN, ordinance of the city of Destin, Florida, providing for the reduction of the speed limit on the entirety of Airport Road from its intersection with US Highway 98 to its intersection with Main Street, a distance of 8,500 plus or minus feet, providing for the reduction of the speed limit on the entirety of 98 Palms Boulevard from its intersection with Main Street to its termination at a private road, servicing a shopping complex, a distance of 1,200 plus or minus feet, providing for the reduction of the speed limit on the entirety of Azalea Drive Drive, from its intersection with Stallman Avenue to its intersection with Benning Drive, distance of 3,700 plus or minus feet, providing for authority, providing for penalties, providing for an effective date. And this is a public hearing. All righty then. Well, seeing how this is a public hearing, uh, I'm going to open up the uh, public comment portion for the second reading of Ordinance uh, 22-04-CN. Is anyone here in the audience that would like to um, uh, make any reference or comments on um, the reduction of speed limit on Airport Road, 98 Palms Boulevard, and Azalea Drive. Kyron. Come on up, Kyron. You know the routine. <laughs> well, you could get wheels for that cane, speed that up a little bit. Oh, no, <laughs> <laughs> oh, no I don't want to do that. Kyron okay. Marler, 616 2nd Street, Destin. Um, I wish I'd have made the first hearing. I'm just curious to what prompted this all of a sudden because uh, it, it's not going to work. I mean, unless you're going to do a lot of enforcement because the average speed of, I've discovered is about 45. Um, usually, luckily, I don't have. I don't think we've had any accidents since the curb has been redone. But uh, spring and summer is coming, so we'll see what happens. But I'm just curious about uh, the, the the reasoning behind it, even though I know that. Uh, it's a great idea. We, it, it's uh, about the same as what we're doing on Beach Drive. It doesn't work a lot of times. But, um, you know, truthfully, uh, unless you have a lot of enforcement, I just don't see how it's going to work. And, I mean, our Sheriff's Department is doing the best they can. But, I mean, seriously, uh, they're not, like I said, it's just not going to work in my opinion. But that's, you know, I'm just curious to what uh, prompted all this. Um, a lot of it had to do with the fact that, uh in, in trying to encourage different modes of traffic and the fact that the uh, uh, slow uh, speed vehicles were approved for every other portion of uh, Destin. Those were the only roads that still maintained a 35 speed limit. We had 30 miles an hour or less on every other road in the city. So for uniformity and safety and the people that want to speed, uh, they do at their own peril. A 30 mile an hour speed limit, as you well know, on Calhoun and Cyber and Kelly and Main Street, people still do 40 miles an hour. So, if, you know, that's just uh, it, uh, 35 means 45 to some people. So having it at 30 for the whole city stops confusion and does provide a level of public safety for those that obey the law. And I'll agree with that as the owner of a LSP. Um, the main problem I see is I, I, I've, uh, my position has changed at Legendary. I'm now working around on Airport Road a lot more. And so, uh, but I'm still hesitant about driving my LSV uh, from my home to there. You, you may time. not after tonight. Yeah. yeah. No. <laughs> we'll see. And we'll I do see. understand because we do have a lot of low speed vehicles and we also still have a lot of them who are being driven by, uh, not by underage uh, people. I know several around uh, the boat ramp which again is one of the reasons I came up about the intersection. Um, I've seen several near near misses in the last couple of weeks. Anyway, thank you. Thank you, Kyron. Uh, we can we can act and legislate laws, but we cannot enact or legislate morality. So, speed speeders beware. Anyways, anyone else that'd like to come up and make a comment on the second reading of this ordinance? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. I have a motion, I have a second. Um, any discussion? We did a nice job of explaining the thought process yeah. behind it. And people are going to go 10 miles over, so we lower it down. Hopefully, they'll slow down. Well, you know, um, you and I both uh, had that discussion previously, so I just wanted to rehash that and uh, to satisfy Kyron's question. So, anyways, uh, let's go ahead and take a vote. Eyes have it, so Thanks, Mayor. There's no ordinance associated with this next public hearing, uh, so I will turn it over to Lewis. I just ask that at some point you open it up for public comment. 
Uh, good evening, Mayor and uh, Council Members. <clears throat> uh, as you know, we're in the process right now of um, updating our land development code. And one of those key things that we are um, looking to establish is clear chain of uh, custody of the various reviews that we have um, for the various projects in the city. Uh, it is not quite as clear as we want it to be in the current code. And so uh, what you have before you is uh, something we've discussed with the LPA about who does what when, uh, so that there's clear guidance to anyone who is uh, proposing to develop in the city so they know exactly um, what the, the, uh, the process involved and, and what is the, uh, the level of, re of review and also uh, the final decision-making process. And so that's what we have before you, no, no um, uh, ordinance um, uh, for your review at this point but give you a clear direction as to our thinking. And if you agree with that, that will be part of the entire uh, package that will come before you uh, in the updated land development code. Uh, Mr. Bagby. <clears throat> I move that the city council direct staff and the city land use attorney to prepare an ordinance codifying the referenced updates to the LDC articles one and two with such codifications to include the recommendations of the LPA and the Harbor and Waterways Board. Mr. Bagby, hold on second. one second. Okay. Oh, we've got a public hearing. Oh, it's a public hearing. Is the motion okay? And then we'll do the public comment before, yeah, before the, the we motion, have discussion. The motion can stand. Uh, you might as well just go ahead and open it up for public comment. That's what I'll do. Enough. That's what I'll do. So Mr. Bagby, uh, you have made a motion and you've second. seconded it. And before we discuss, this motion, I'd like to uh, open this up for public comment for anyone that would li ha like to weigh in on this particular um, uh, issue. Seeing none, I'll go ahead and close the public comment portion of it. And we have a couple folks that would like to speak. Uh, Dewey? Okay, Dewey, you're up first, sir. Thank you, Mayor. And, and generally, I was going to support what Mr. Bagby said. I, I thought the recommendations that came from the LPA and the waterways were things that I generally agree with, so I'll support the motion. Any other discussion concerning this motion? Second? Seeing none, let's go ahead and take this to a vote. Vote is unanimous, so moved. Lewis, you got a lot on your plate, so keep them coming. Yeah, so it's right. All right, uh, 5C was withdrawn, so now we're back to item six, and we'll throw everybody a curveball, seeing how I'm wearing a, a sports jacket, which I never wear. So we'll start with, we'll, I'm going to leave the attorneys last as normal, um, and, and um, we're going to start with uh, Mr. King. I'd just like to say to <clears throat> Matt and the, everybody in, involved with the Compass uh, deal, the livery vessel deal, I think having Mike come up here and sing you guys' praises tonight was a huge win for the city as a whole. And, and congrats and commend you guys. Uh, nice job. And the the point that I was trying to make is, as far as the uh, Joe's Bayou deal goes is I think handing the flyer out to – People at the ramp is one thing, but having it on you and being able to take it to Half Hitch or Ships Chandler or, you know, Legendary or who, you know, the places where people, where boaters go, you know, at the AOC, I spend, I, I stop there five times a week. If I saw it on the door right there, you know, usually it's before my day really fires off or at the end of my day, it's on the way home. I think I would be inclined to do it if I saw it there, but having it, having it readily available, having a hundred people do it, I mean, it may be a task, but like, I think the more people who can who can weigh into that, the better. Um, I'll have it on on me or some electronic version of it to hand to people who whose whose opinion I value, <clears throat> and try to keep try to keep as many. I don't know. Selfishly, I want to I want it to be destined residents who are weighing in on it more than anything, you know. But that's all I got. Thanks. Thanks, Councilwoman Abear. Thank you, Mayor. A couple of things. Um, as the TDC representative for our council, um, uh, we uh, talked to Jennifer Adams today, some key things from this morning's meeting. Um, we've started to collect tourist taxes locally for the South End, and we'll start March 1st, countywide. 
And also TDC approved $2 million for two vessels to add to our artificial reef program. So those are two big wins. And uh, I think, you know, we're just moving in the right direction just to re reinforce the fact that the TDC has done so much. And Jennifer Adams is just such a, an awesome, fearless leader. And I think Shane can come up here and speak, you know, forever about how much stuff she's done since she's taken over and helped us as a city as well as the county um, be more successful in, in getting more monies and doing more programs and putting things out there for our visitors and our, our residents here. Um, and then another note I wanted to bring up was just, we've had some really awesome new businesses that have come into town. And being an ambassador on the, the chamber, it's really come to light that there are so many new businesses that have come into Destin. I mean, you know, we had the couple that came in and opened up the little pet grooming place, Barks and Bubbles, and they just signed up to be part of the chamber. And uh, F45, <laughs> they're a phenomenal workout. And Zachary and Brandon came into town and they, they had done all the research and they took, they said it took about six months to go through the permitting and processing, you know, just getting things done to get them up and running. Um, and I'm going to tell you right now, there's so many people that are like, I keep running into them. I ran into one of the ladies that's a realtor there this at class, and she was like, oh, you're on council with Johnny and Kevin. And she was like, get him and them in here. Um, but then we've got some other businesses that have opened, and I just... I want people to realize, you know, there are a lot of new places, new things to do, new restaurants. Um, go to the chamber site. If you're not part of the chamber, be a part. If you're a business person or you're just a resident, you don't have to have a business to be a member of the chamber. But the chamber has an awesome outreach. And just to plug for them, they're really looking for somebody that can be like a, the salesperson for the chamber. We lost awesome person that was working for the chamber so i mean i'm calling businesses hey don't you want to be part of the chamber they're like what how do you do that you know I'm like yeah you get a ribbon cutting so if you know anybody that likes to do sales it's a good paying job they really need somebody they've been interviewing now for a couple months and and just like most businesses you can't find employees you just you know can't pay them enough this is a good paying job and it's a fun job and you get to work with Shane. I mean, you know, if I didn't already have a job, I'd go do this job, you know? <laughs> anyway, thank you, Mayor. Mr. Mayor. Mr. Destin. Thank you, Mayor. I have two short items, hopefully. Um, we requested when we reviewed our drawing on the Crosstown Connector that the, arch, arch, not architect, the engineers bring us a drawing, a rendering. They said they would have it in two weeks. Um, please place this back on the agenda for me on the next meeting. That'll be four weeks. Uh, that swale is humongous. If you will go over to my parking lot at Dewey's on the Harbor, you will see two very small swales in the front. We've got 1,500 feet of perforated pipe under that parking lot. They can design a swale for us. It allows us to make maximum use of the uh, recreational area, and their job is to do what we ask them to do and there's no reason we can't use all of that area for our recreation that we're trying to do. So I'll ask that that be placed back on the agenda and invite them to come talk to us again. My other item is I think I asked staff when our compensation study was going to be ready at the last meeting. I was told February, today is the 22nd. We have six days left. Give me a report on where that is. We, uh, we did receive some additional data and we actually have interviews with our uh, managers on that this week, at the end of this week, beginning. We do plan on bringing that back to council in March and we are working on that absolutely as fast as possible because we want to get this one done. First meeting, second meeting? We are shooting for the first meeting. I'll be asking you about it again. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. That's all for me. Thank you, Mr. Destin. Mr. Uh, Wagner. All right, well, you, my first one was your first one, so I'm glad you said that, and I'm sure you can follow up way better than I can. <laughs> so I appreciate that, and I want to know what you've done to her as far as what, what she do in Destin Forward class to do that shameless plug. <laughs> but no, you guys are awesome. Uh, I don't really have anything. That was just the one thing was uh, the uh, linear park. Thanks, sir. And Mr. Braden. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Jim, I did think, think of two more. We reduced the height of the buildings, and we reduced the... Um, the houses per square foot or per, per, per uh, acre. acre, yeah. Um, but we we just need to get a lot more aggressive. And floor density. Yes, we need, just need to get a lot more aggressive on that. I think. Um, 
the gentleman that gave the presentation tonight with that street uh, survey, whatever you want to call it, a while ago, um, did he have to fill out any type of presentation application, submit his application, or submit his presentation to the city staff to review before he did that tonight? You're talking about Allen, right? The, the, the road yeah. study? Yeah, or the... Or the, the gentleman that gave the, the yeah the gentleman that gave the uh, presentation about Joe's Bayou and all that do they have to submit anything or give staff anything? Yeah, Pierce Barrett from DEP that gave that, and we did request him to come and give an update as council has asked us to keep them informed on the status of that. Um, and I, based on other projects that we've had, I wanted to make sure that there was an update done before the 30% were presented where changes could still be made at 30. They get very difficult at 60 and near impossible at 90. So, Does the staff review that before it and, and the, maybe the slides and stuff that, that come up before he does the presentation? I, I, I personally did not get to review those. Okay. Um, my next question is, is if, if one of the citizens wants to do a presentation, is that, is that allowed or is that something in the city that says a citizen can do a presentation, but staff has the say so of when, how, where, and who can do it or how was that process? Ray, would you like to cover the process for speaking at a council meeting? Well, there are three ways you can speak, of course, is to public uh, comments uh, and then, of course, the public hearing. Uh, the one for tonight, uh, the lady who spoke earlier was supposed to speak at the last meeting, uh, was supposed to make a presentation, but uh, because of the uh, quasi-judicial uh, hearing that was supposed to be scheduled for today, uh, that was uh, not allowed. But. Uh, she went ahead and spoke in generic terms last last uh, meeting, and then today uh, at this meeting he was she was supposed to uh, speak again, but of course you know the uh, project was uh, was pulled, so we allowed her to speak uh, during public comments, but uh, she was actually speaking for several people who volunteered their time, <clears throat> their time to, to, to her. And that's why she was allowed to speak for, I guess the mayor gave her 10 minutes. There were and, uh, 37 can, people here. As her. you can see, there was a couple dozen people here. So she was speaking for most of them too, so. Yeah, and, wow. and, and, and I'll take that answer there, uh, Rodney. Uh, because of those scenarios and the fact that it was not gonna be a quasi-judicial hearing where she'd have an opportunity to make her full presentation and the, uh, applicant uh, mayor mayor I didn't ask any, I didn't ask anything about tonight Are you talking about the I, I, I simply that? asked staff is there any oh okay process? I, I thought you were talking about the no. presentation when I went I just, with the I just want to know if there's any process for a, a citizen to do a presentation let me try and answer Rodney and I might need Lance and Webb to help me I, I think I'm aware of the process for a member of the public to not an agency like FDP where the staff is specifically requesting they make the special presentation. If a member of the public wants to make a presentation on any subject matter at all, that does have a review process that staff goes through. They submit a form and they describe what it, the nature of the uh, comment is going to be, and then staff reviews it and determines whether it fits within the nature of that agenda, whether it's something council might want to hear. A lot of times, I think they consult individually with council members during your pre-agenda meetings. I, I've heard that before. Uh, so I think that's the general process. But uh, again, I'm not intimately involved in that process. So if Lance or Webb have anything they want to add to it, please do. You know, just to be clear, there is an application for that process where a, an individual can fill it out. And it has to be done, I believe, seven days before the agenda or something along that line. And it goes to the city clerk. And if I may add, and that was done at the last meeting. Uh, she did complete a speaker form and uh, provided uh, the uh, PowerPoint. And real quick, real quick, I think that that process is not something that staff just invented. I, I believe that was codified in a resolution, correct? 
that, that I, not this council put together. Dewey, you might have been on the council that did that actually, I think, yeah. So if a, a citizen wants to do a presentation, there's an application they can fill out, and then it's really up to the city staff to determine, they determine whether or not no, they're no, going to allow it. I found in the resolution. So why, I mean, that's kind of what I just heard, that the staff's going to decide whether it goes on the agenda or not, or where they get to speak. I don't know the exact language of the resolution. I believe that staff does have some limited discretion. I don't think you can come up here and start talking about any topic you want. I think it has to be generally related to the business of the city and the city council. I don't know exactly. It looks like Ray might know. Let me get through, let me get through on this particular issue. Yeah. It is in a resolution covered under public presentation. I think Mr. Bagby pointed that out when we were uh, revising our resolution. So it, it's been added. Thanks, and I, I did want to address this particular scenario because this particular scenario where we knew we had a quasi-judicial land use development coming up and we knew we had an applicant who wanted to make a presentation outside that quasi-judicial process, we were concerned that that might be viewed as prejudicial, particularly given the den denial at the last council meeting. So we simply wanted to put this city council, if the city council were to deny it according to another code provision, and it is as good a position as possible if the, if the uh, denial was appealed to the circuit court so that uh, we could try and defend it in that setting. Uh, because if there is an appearance that the due process of the applicant is violated, that is generally an automatic reversal at the circuit court level. So that was the thought process of city staff, the land use attorney, and myself leading into this particular presentation, I'll call it a presentation, it was presented during public comments, but leading into what happened tonight. It was complicated by the fact that we had an applicant, there was gonna be a quasi-judicial hearing, we published an agenda, we still believe there's gonna be a QJ, then he pulls the QJ off the agenda, so then we tried to fashion what we felt was a fair and effective remedy for that particular uh, speaker, and we worked with her, and I, I believe we reached a fair result, ultimately, uh, the mayor has pretty wide discretion on the amount of time, the time, manner, and place restriction placed on public comments. So, I mean, that was our thought process. She was Are asking for 18 to 20 perfect. minutes, and I said that was under the circumstance with everything that was on our agenda that I'd give her 10 minutes as a courtesy in, in retrospect to all the things. I also recommended if she could cut it in half, she could come back up and get an additional time to, you know, in a subsequent meetings. So we just, this was a classic case of not wanting a, a, a person, a member of our public, not to have an opportunity to speak, but at the same time, uh, especially when you have 50, 60 people now, if everybody would have took their three minutes, we'd had uh, close to an hour of public comment. That's the whole reason for the three minute or you know five minute timelines in the very first place. That's what, and it's not just this council that does that. It's every, uh, it's every council and commission throughout the country, not not just in the state of Florida. So I tried to be, with the discretion that's a, awarded me as chairman of the meeting, I tried to be fair with her, conscientious about the legal peril that we could get in, and so that's that's how that all all played out. But th so, there is a, there are protocols, and in, as in all things, you know, we, we try to live by the spirit of the law. As much as the letter of the law, sometimes the spirit's almost important than the letter of the law, and I think that was such a case here when it comes I, to public I, input. I agree. Um, so in the resolution, is there a time timeline? Yes, five minutes. Five minutes. It, I believe it's five minutes if it's on behalf of a group of people. Okay. So that's, a, I mean, if, and I know this was, the one tonight was, you know, had some legal issues, but if there's not any legal issues, and you know, if somebody wants to do a presentation and put some, some photos up on the overhead they know going into it they got five minutes instead of the three minutes they'll they, they get five okay but, okay um that's all i got mayor thank you thank you mr Braden. and go ahead I'll uh, on rodney's thing though where i thought he was going to go uh can we get copies? We didn't get a we didn't have a copy of the DEP. Obviously, he's the state, so he doesn't have to give us a copy in our read aheads. But can we get a copy of his and maybe um, hers, hers, uh, Lisa's uh, presentation? 
and then the on Mr. Destin's thing, ask ask them to have their stormwater person either on the phone or what their stormwater engineer because I'll have some specific questions for him if he doesn't make Mr. Destin happy. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to close out. I want to thank everybody uh, uh, for tonight's meeting. Um, I'm going to uh, give our two attorneys an opportunity to speak. I just want to remind everybody that there will be a final public comment period. Um, I want to thank this council for uh, the privilege and honor to serve as chairman of this panel and committee. That was my last state of the city addressed. And, uh, and I'm looking forward to the next few months because uh, not only that was a little lengthy, but it, the reason it was lengthy is because we've accomplished so much in the last 12 months. And I, and I really look forward to the, the energy and the direction and the speed that, that this council has been working towards since January 1st is incredible. And I think we're going to accomplish a whole lot of stuff before the, the November election process. And, and uh, my term is over and, and maybe that of a few other folks. But uh, why don't you just give us a bunch of tomahawk up. steaks or something? This will be your last one. No kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh we will have that celebration on the first Wednesday in November. <laughs> when you're gone. On me, all of you, all of you. All right. So with that being said, and no further ado, uh, I uh, reach out to Kim. Do you have anything tonight, Kim? No, I don't. Thank you, Mayor. Kyle? Nothing for me. All right. Last uh, swing at the bat for public comment. Come on up, Mayor Shane. Uh, you already got your five minutes. <laughs> you got three yeah, minutes yeah, on three. the dot. All right. I got seven things to talk about. Can I get 21? No, I just, I have some concern up here about y'all getting the word out about your surveys. Elizabeth and I are both on Catherine's email list. I think I saw the last one that y'all were playing with in our email that went out today. And so as soon as you get this other one on March 1st, if we can, I know, I know Catherine will send it to us. I'm actually having lunch with her on Monday. Um, um, She'll get that to us and that will get out as well. Um, speed limits and traffic, something needs to be done on the east side of town on Highway 98. Y'all should come sit with me in my conference room and just watch what happens out there and listen to the tires and the horns. There's going to be something really, really bad uh, coming toward the office from the east. They hit Emerald Bay where they can get in the left lane and it. people are passing me and I'm going, God, am I going that slow? And I'm going, I'm running 60. And people are just blowing past me. So this is, there's some concern there. Um, yeah. <laughs> we are taking notes. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a red Mercedes. Um, <laughs> um, but just I just want to throw that since traffic and, and, and speed limits have been part of the topic tonight. And, um, and thank you for everything that you said. Appreciate that. And it's not been a couple of minutes. It's been like five that I've been trying to find somebody. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All righty then. <laughs> Any other comments? Come on up. Uh, John Stevens, 4025 Indian Trail. Um, real quick, Ronnie, thanks for taking the target off delivery back and putting it on the roads. Thank you. Um, I want to give a quick update from the uh, Water Support Coalition. Um, we are actually filming our second video in March, so hopefully we'll get that one done for you guys and show you all that video when it's done. Um, and then I uh, want to say thank you for having cookies for the people that stayed the whole meeting, too. Uh, <laughs> uh, oh, and but, uh, I think they already said about that 9 a.m. meeting for tomorrow. Um, it's uh, just a workshop with the, uh, all the law enforcement, just kind of get things going for the beginning of the season. Um, and then one quick question. I noticed um, that there was no spring youth soccer. Was there, uh, was there a reason why? Say that again? There, there was no youth spring soccer this year? No youth spring soccer? Yeah, I, I, I know last year my kids did it, and I didn't see it on, on the schedule this year. For the young ones. The little ones this year to start. When does that start, Lisa? Okay, so you don't have the older ones, though? Not at this time. Okay. All right, that's all I got. All right, thanks, Thank sir. You. All right, anyone else? All right, going once, going twice. Oh, there we go.
I'm glad you got up there quick. I was about to hit the hammer. Uh, John Frutiger, 501, 501 Gulf Shore Drive. Thanks, John. Uh, I guess I'm not the only one that's got concerns about the traffic's traffic situation, I guess. Uh, Gulf Shore Drive, the stop signs just seem to be a recommendation. And I live at the corner over there by Destin Point, and it's everybody and anybody that runs those things. I've almost gotten hit crossing the street there. Maybe if we could do a crosswalk or something there. But another thought, has Destin ever thought about doing their own police department? Every time I call Oklahoma County and have them come patrol Hol or Holiday Isle, Gulf Shore Drive, uh, they say they can't you know, permanently patrol it. Um, they say they can you know, put more of an effort into patrolling uh, for two weeks at a time. I was like, so I got to call every two weeks, I guess, you know. But has Destin ever thought about creating their own police force? And where, where do we stand on that? And would we lose the Okaloosa County Sheriff's support if we did that? Or, or, or? Um, what, what the problem is, is we got, we're a small town with big city problems and uh, with a small town budget. And in, in, in to do a police department or trash collection or any of these, we'd have to increase your property taxes. And that is usually a political uh, firestorm. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, it's been uh, explored in the past. In fact, I think it's in my tenure, we, we've, we've also had that. For the level of service we get, for the money that we spent, uh, we get exceptional service, in my opinion, from the sheriff's department. And uh, uh, if, you, if you look at the budgets of uh, towns like uh, Fort Walton Beach, which is twice as big as us, and look at their budget, you, you can get a real quick picture of why we don't have a police department. It's not something I've, if, if the council wants to explore those options again, I mean, I'm not against that, yeah. but, but, but there's, a, there's some challenges to that, and mostly it's financial, and the burden is always borne on the people. It's a tax-paying right. deal. So what, what, what are we going to do to address, you know, I mean, I've, I've noticed it all over Destin, but specifically right outside of my home, and nobody stops at stop signs. Like you stated earlier, the speed limit's 30, you go 45, and it's throughout town. And it's getting even worse since we're building all those new apartments, since we're expanding, you know, the size of the, the population here. Well, it, it's, it's kind of like we said jokingly, we have the uh, guy in green in the back, but uh, the, uh, the sheriff, and the sheriff's department, under sheriff, they, a couple of them live in Destin. I mean, they take it seriously, and, and they do the best they can with the resources they have. But I mean, then again, it's just a matter of, you know, when you drive, you see people pulled over all the time. But when you catch that one, there's 35 that drive by while the officers, you know, I, you just, it, it, it's a problem. It's a, it's, but it's a, it's a moral problem and not a. Not an enforcement problem. Our guys will write a ticket if they catch you. It's Are just there a grants or anything them. that we can apply for to up the either capacity of Oklahoma County Sheriffs or you know maybe support a small town sheriff? Or so, is there anything that the federal government can fund our police? Well, they're, in this here area? lately they haven't been in the habit of funding police nationwide, so that, that, that that's yeah. a big issue. So, and and of course, like everybody in here that has their own business, uh, they've got manning issues just like everyone else. Our city has manning issues. We can't find enough people willing, you know, quality people that want to work. So, um, I feel your pain, and we're not, you know, it's not ignored by any stretch of the imagination by this council. You've heard the discussions. You know, we're Correct. reducing speed limits, we're putting in crosswalks, speed bumps, we're trying to calm traffic and all that. So it's 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 not it's not an issue that's being ignored. But I don't care how many people we how many officers we put there or how many speed limits we change, you're still going to have it because not everybody abides by the law. So is there, is there a way to put speed speed bumps in certain areas? You know, there absolutely I know they is. did it on uh, Beach Drive. But There's a process there... for any community to okay. apply for speed bumps in their neighborhoods. Um, you can get them to sign for it. your neighbors. Yep. Okay. Um, uh, you can you can contact our city manager or deputy city manager, and they will help you uh, walk through that process to address traffic and speeds and stuff in your community, outside of calling the sheriff's department and right. trying to get a radar sign or that kind of stuff. Does anyone else want to weigh in? Go ahead, Dewey. I was just going to say this is a continuing issue that we're looking at constantly. Mm -hmm. If you come up with some good ideas, please bring them to us. There are a number of innovative ways we can address it. I'm sure the sheriff's department will will be happy to work with us. Um, you know, back in the day, uh, semi unmarked cars were quite effective. There are some other things we can try, and, and we are we are going to continue to pursue 
how we can slow it down. And John, just, in your microcosm of your world, just like my world over on Mars Street is different than your world on your street, uh, our deputies last year responded to 43,000 calls. Oh, I don't doubt in it. 2021. Break, the coming. So and it's, it's going to be so, bad this year. And we, we, you don't have enough people to, to, no, to cover 100%. So, uh, 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 Mr. Dustin's recommendations are um, 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 heartfelt and our council and staff and our public's worst department uh you can approach any of us anytime you can call every single one of these council members and ask for them to be your champion for your your community and come up with some ideas all right i all right, appreciate your you, time thank you and I, I would encourage you to attend the next public works public safety committee meeting they are the ones that no that's a no no that's the visioning because they're the ones that speed humps crosswalks signage stop signs it goes through them to us and, and those will, meetings are posted on the city yeah. website you just go to the agenda center and you'll find where, where yeah. the uh, public you works and safety planning is get with michael. staff to make a presentation to them and say you see michael yeah, that's the guy yeah there you go yeah the, the uh, next public works public safety committee meeting is on march 8th tuesday at 5 30 in this room there you go thank you, there you go. all right anyone else Going once, going twice, meeting adjourned.